Good evening, I am the Dungeon Master, and I will be hosting this campaign of Tyranny of Dragons. What you are about to witness is the use of AI technology combined with Roll20 and the imagination of a British ginger. May God have mercy on his soul. Good evening, gentlemen. I trust this environment will suit for the foreseeable campaign. Ah, this is much nicer than that basement. No offense, Ben. None taken. I actually agree this feels more fitting for our next campaign. I'm confused. What's new? Yeah, yeah. Aren't we still in the middle of a campaign? That is correct, Joe. However, Alex needs some time to get the next session ready, and I have a campaign I've been eagerly wanting to try out, so for now. Would you grace me with your time and take part in this while he works on Fate of the Votes? He'll be in touch when he's ready for your return. Yeah, that sounds like fun. It'll be great to try out something other than a cleric. Wait. Does this mean I get to finally be a giant? Well, maybe not a full giant. How about a Goliath? I'll take it. Screw you, Ben. Whatever, dude. I'm just relieved you didn't ask to be- Can I be Jewish? Are we really doing this again? Sorry, Donald, but you've just agreed to be a Goliath. Besides, Jewish isn't a race in Dungeons and Dragons. Fine, I'll stick with Goliath. I'm also going to be a barbarian and swole. I hear it's all the craze these days. I don't know why. I saw that Harry Spotter video like a thousand times. And it, I think it'll work for my character. You can call me Swole Nald Stomp. Okay, that's fine. But before we get into your characters, let me tell you a little about the campaign. Tyranny of Dragons is an adventure that covers two tales, Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Timat. It is set in the Forgotten Realms on Farron's western shore, the Sword Coast. The bulk of this adventure will take place on the stretch between Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter. You'll be starting at level one, and ending around level 15. You all with me so far? Seems straightforward enough. Sounds good to me. I think even Sleepy Joe will be able to follow this. But seriously, this sounds pretty dope so far. Yeah, this sounds fun. What else do we need to know? Only a few things. As characters in this world, you are aware of a group known as the Cult of Dragons. They have existed for centuries, and although their existence is known, their motives for what they do are not. All you really know about them is that they revere evil dragons and they have members in almost every city. When the adventure begins, you will be traveling as a group towards the town of Greenest, which is located at the very south of the Sword Coast. You will need to have a reason as to why you would be visiting this town. I can help you with some suggestions from the module if you cannot think of any. Dragonborns, kobolds, and tieflings are banned races as they are associated with the cult of dragons and therefore would give your characters a particularly hard time. You will need to decide on your subclass today when creating your character, even though you are starting at level one. And finally, you may refer to me as the dungeon master. My word is law. I will allow asking for clarifications and confirmations, but any confrontations will swiftly see to your expirations. Do I make myself clear? Yeah, we got it. You're the boss. Now, can I finish my character? By all means, continue. Bitching, are we rolling for stats? You may if you want to, but I will not be allowing re-rolls. This also goes for if you decide to roll for HP on your level ups. Can we go between rolls and take the average? Or do we need to decide on that now? So long as you tell me beforehand, I'll allow you to swap between rolls and the average. Okay, then I will be rolling for my stats. What the heck? I was just about to do it, and you go and sneak up on me like a damn drone strike. Can't help it if you're slow, Donald. Ooh, you want beef? Fine with me. Let's see those rolls, Barack. The first roll of the campaign. You got this, Barack. Get a three, 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 get a three. Get a three. Hell fucking yeah. Sweet 16, baby. Fucking rigged. And a 14, looking good so far. Ah, it's going down. Still in the positive. What was that, Trump? I can't hear you over my massive numbers. Seriously, all double digits? These look great, Barack. Ha, there it is. Okay, that's pretty good. I can work with this. I shall be a wizard and my race will be rock gnome. Be careful that I don't step on you. Now it's my- Can I go next? Motherfucker. Sure, Joe. Let's see the rolls. Off to a great start. I've got a good feeling about this. Could have been worse. Smelling some fudging going on? 
You're just mad I'll have better roles than you. These are looking really good so far. Oh, wow, 315s is amazing. That is some sticky fudge. This works for me. I'm going to be a human fighter. And guess what, Donald? What? I, too, will be swole. The only thing that's swole about you is that tumor growing in your brain. But whatever, do what you want. Now I'm going to trump you all with my awesome... Rolling the dice! Of course the Jew sneaks in and steals my moment. You got this, Ben. 13 is good. When it's not 14, sure. Bad luck, Ben. I can do better. I'm just warming up. Another 13. Not the best, but at least it's just one low number. What was that you were just saying? I can make it work. More double digits. Nearly there, dude. They're not terrible. Yeah, they could have been way worse. It'll be fine. I'm going to be a high elf cleric. Really? With those stats, are you sure? Trust me, I've got it covered. Okay, Donald, you're up. Now's the time to show you all how it's done. Part of the cards or some anime shit. Well, I'm just warming up. You'll see. Boom, baby. Give me that 16. Not seeing anything too special so far, Donald. Kiss my ass. 17. Wow, that's fantastic. Of course it is. My godlike roles are unmatched. Oh, damn. These are really good. Not exactly breaking records, but still nice. It's just what I need to be swollenalled. And I've decided on the subclass. If you'll allow it, Dungeon Master, it's Unearthed Arcana, Path of the Giant. Hmm, that could be interesting for the story. Very well, I shall allow it. Then behold, peasants, to the glory that is swole gnawed stomp. Look at those magnificent nipples and the kick-ass stats. No enemy will be able to withstand my might or my throbbing rage. Your throbbing rage? I know what I said. Whatever, here's my character sheet. Bama the Wise. I've included my spell list as well. This has us covered for now. And I will take inspiration from our other campaign and take Chronergy Magic. How about Bam Bam the Smoothwise? Why? It just sounds better is all. I'm going to stick with Bam of the Wise. Thanks. Can my character call you Bam Bam? I guess so. Who's your character? You can call me Gormley Whitebeard. Because I am named Gormley and I have a white beard. I will take on the samurai subclass to aid in protecting my team and striking fear into our enemies. Where did you get the name Gurmley from? It was in that movie. One with the gay wizard and the gay little man and the super gay guy with long blonde hair. Legless. Hold up, are you talking about Lord of the Rings? Nah, not that. It was called Lord of the Cock Rings. There's a dwarf in it who takes the one cock ring and shoves it up. We don't need to hear any more, Joe. In fact, I shall show you all my character sheet now. Sharpen fact spitter. I have already written up my sheet and still need to add in my subclass information. I'll be taking the order domain with my deity being Tyr. I'll gain additional spells command and heroism, proficiency in persuasion and heavy armor. Also an ability called voice of authority, which I think works well as I'll be spitting straight facts all day long. Funny you mentioned spitting. In that movie, they never spit. Are we done now, dungeon master? Not quite yet. I still need a reason for why you are going to greenest. Because you told us to. It needs to be a little more than that, Joe. If none of you has a reason, then may I suggest something from the list in my book? So do we just roll a d10 or can we pick something? It is entirely down to you. There's so many choices. Hmm, I'm not sure which to pick. Maybe I'll roll for mine. I may need some help choosing. I think I know which one I want. Perhaps you all need a little time to decide. Very well. When we next meet for session one, I expect you all to have chosen a campaign bond. Until next time, gentlemen. Good evening, gentlemen. I trust you're all ready for session one. I was ready from the moment I walked into the tavern. I'm super pumped for this. Nothing is going to bring me down. Hell yeah. Me and Donald with our super swole bro characters are going to rock this world. And just like that, I'm depressed. Don't be down, man. We're going to bro shake our way through any problems. Please stop talking like we're friends. You're right, Donald. We're not friends. We're... Don't say it. Family. I'm about to quit this campaign before it's even started. Before this campaign is over, you will see me in a different light. I don't think more light is going to improve that face of yours. We'll see. If you two are done having a moment, have you all decided on your campaign bonds? Got mine ready. Same here. Hashtag me too. Wait, what were we meant to do? Seriously. You had one thing this to do. This is going to be a long campaign. And when are you going to start way. paying attention? Damn Biden. Memory like a pasta strainer. Enough. 
I have heard all that I can stomach. So let me make one thing very clear. You are a team. In here, you'll support and help each other. No more insults. No more putting anyone down. Do you all understand? Yes, I'm sorry, Joe. It won't happen again. My apologies. You're asking a lot, Dungeon Master, but you are the boss. I'll keep any playful banter strictly to my character going forward. That sound good to you, Biden? Is, is he asleep? Joe. Joe. Russiagate. What? Oh, yeah. Sorry I dozed off. I've got my campaign bond Dungeon Master. It came to me in a dream. Okay, then. Without further delay, let us begin session one. Your story begins with the four of you traveling along a long, winding road from the deep south. You have hitched a ride with a traveling fruit merchant, as walking the journey would be considered foolish at best and dangerous at worst. You do not know each other, but have, one by one, taken a seat on the back of the trader's wagon. The sun is slowly setting, and you can hear the sounds of hundreds of birds flying overhead, away from the direction you are heading, the town of Greenest. Sitting side by side is Swolnald and Bama. Opposite is Sharpen and Gurmly. The space is tight and the smell of fresh fruit lingers heavily in the air. Out of the back of the cart, you can see the mountain path you had traveled. With the once warm sun now beginning to slowly descend behind it, you feel the cold temperature equally rise. It is late autumn, and the days have been growing shorter and much colder the further north you travel. Mm -hmm. The fruit merchant, whose cart you have hitched a ride on, mm -hmm. hums a tune to himself as the horse trots along at a steady pace. What do we know about the fruit merchant? Mm -hmm. Very little. You have seen that he is a gnome of sorts. Mm -hmm. Elderly, with a thick white beard and ragged clothing. I call out to him, Hey, Gramps, just how much further is it to Greenest? The smell of apples is getting on my nerves. The gnome stops his humming. You see above you in the canopy a small flap open, and his face is in view as he looks down on you with his tiny, slightly milky eyes. Longer than you'd be hoping for, but sooner than if you were walking. I look at the others. Any of you know how to steer a cart? I say we knock him out and speed this journey up. My nipples could cut parchment. Say that any louder and he may throw you off. Or worse, all of us if he thinks we're together. I'd like to see him try. I'd like to see this journey to Greenest in peace. The slow pace is relaxing. Let's keep it that way. And I grip the hilt of my long sword and look directly at Swolnald. Joe, give me an intimidation check and Donald, an insight check to contest. Swolnald. You are unable to tell if Gurmley is bluffing or deadly serious. He looks as if he would not hesitate to use that sword against you if it were to mean he would get a peaceful ride. You accept that this would not be a wise time for conflict and fall silent. But my character would never... Nat fucking 20! Sit your ass down and shut the fuck up! You know what? I'm impressed by the balls on this one. Okay, I say no more about the gnome and instead look to the little guy sitting next to me. What are you? A dwarf? I don't respond but instead stare out the back of the cart, watching the sun set with an expression of pain on my face. You a mute or something? The fifth night approaches, and with it, another visit into the darkness and despair. Well, you seem delightful. Is that why you're going to Greenest? You a comedic bard? What I am is a wizard and a gnome. Now acknowledging Swolnald and looking up at him with a stern look, my business is just that and none of yours, sir. Are all gnomes this touchy about answering questions, I say, as I turn my gaze on to sharpen? Actually, gnomes are usually full of life and quite vibrant. Tell me, Sir Wizard, what ails you? I look from Swolnald to sharpen, and my expression changes from stern back to pain. A riddle I seek an answer for. Every five nights I dream a most wicked dream. No, a nightmare of terrible things that I wish not to regale. They haunt me, and to speak of them in the waking world would make me feel worse than I already do but I sense that the answers I seek reside in greenest. Very well. I shall ask no more of something that clearly troubles you. I, too, seek answers in greenest. I am looking for my childhood friend. I had heard she was taken there against her will by a strange cult. I shift uncomfortably at the word cult. What kind of cult do you speak of? They call themselves the cult of the dragon. I, I sit, sit up, up at, at the, the word, word dragon. dragon. You, too, know of them? I have heard of them. 
However, I'm traveling to Greenest to avoid them and lay low. I got into a fight with a gang several days ago, and I barely escaped with my life. Their last words I heard was, the cult of the dragon never forgets and always avenges. If what I hear is true, there may be more of them in Greenest. If they know of you, you may want to consider getting off and going elsewhere. I'll take my chances. I can hide pretty well if I need to, but thanks. Well, I don't know much about this cult, but I'm heading to Greenest by my good friend and mentor, Anthar Froom. You may have heard of him. Great guy. Champion of good. Slayer of the trolls of Twittar. He has tasked me with investigating rumors of dragon activity happening in Greenest. So if this cult is involved, they won't know what's hit them when the mighty Swolnald Stomp comes to town. Is that your name? Swolnald Stomp? You bet your skinny ass it is elf. What's yours? Facts bitter, sharpen facts bitter. Have I heard of the name facts bitter before? Roll me a history check. Man, these rolls suck. Okay, fine. What about you, tiny man? You got a name or should we just call you Midget Killjoy? I clench my fist and small flames begin to emerge and surround it. It would be very foolish of you to call me that again. You may refer to me as Bama, the wise, henceforth. As we're giving out our names, you may call me Gormley Whitebeard. I wasn't asking, but good to know, I guess. I look at Sharpen. You mentioned your friend was taken against her will. Do you know what this cult would want with her? I do not, but the reasons don't matter. What's important is that I save her and bring her back to her family. I noticed a hesitation when he said he didn't know why they took her. Can I tell if he is lying? Roll an insight check. With high insight, you can tell that Sharpen is not being completely honest with you, although it may just be due to you all being strangers and does not wish to delve deeply into the subject. Something about his hesitation makes you suspect otherwise. I say nothing and give no indication that I have seen through his lie but I make a mental note of this. The next hour passes in silence with the exception of the horse's hooves and the merchant's occasional humming. The sun has now disappeared and the moon has begun rising. You feel the cold in your chests and each breath you exhale lets out a stream of warm air that quickly evaporates. The flap above you opens up and the gnome's face appears. We'll be reaching greenest very soon, just over this hill and you'll be able to see it if you stuck your heads out the sides. It's cold enough inside. I'll wait until we're within the town and outside the entrance of the local tavern before I step one foot out there. How can you be this cold? Aren't Goliaths used to mountain temperatures? Yeah, obviously we are. We're great like that, but I grew up in the deep south and not in any mountains. I never built up a tolerance to the cold. The cold never bothered me, so I'll take a look. Keeping a firm grip on the cart, I lean out the side of it to get a view of the town. Let's have a strength check, Joe. Seriously, what is it with you and your fudge rolls? You hang onto the side with ease, and as you reach the peak of the hill, the cart comes to an abrupt stop. Can I see greenest? You do indeed see the town, but it is not a favorable scene to behold. It is almost too easy to see greenest as fire is raging from house to house. Although you are still some distance, there is no mistaking the sounds of screaming people. I call to the others. Everyone, Greenest is ablaze and the people are in trouble. I stand up. What are we doing just sitting here? Merchant, ride on with haste. The fruit merchant does not respond and the horse does not move on. Who's wishing they listen to me now, huh? Come on, Gramps, shit or get off the pot. We got some hero work to be doing. Don't. Don't you see it? Says the merchant in a terrified whisper. I jump out of the cart and look to the town. So do I. I also get out of the cart. You all stand there, next to the cart, and stare at the terrible sight of the burning town. You can all hear the screams of many people, the shouting of what may be soldiers, and tiny figures running here and there. Then, you see it, high up above the town, coming in and out of focus, through the thick black smoke. A set of blue wings, a long scaly tail, a large open mouth, and a jet of bright flames erupting from it as it blasts another house. Greenest is being attacked by a dragon. I'd say that counts as dragon activity. Dungeon Master, you mentioned there was fire coming from it, but you also said it had blue wings. Would that not mean it was actually shooting electricity and not fire? 
Don't be a smart ass, Ben. It's all right, Barack. Yes, Ben, you are correct. I misspoke. It is indeed using its electric breath weapon, which on impact is causing fire. Thank you for pointing that out. No problem. Does this mean we now have a rules lawyer? I prefer the term rules advisor. Has less of a negative connotation. Advisors are great. I've got loads of them, and they're always giving me advice about what to say, where to walk, which teleprompter to read from, which girl's hair I haven't sniffed yet. Sometimes I think you say this shit on purpose. Anyway, my question is, are we going to be allowing someone to contradict our dungeon master, whether it's a lawyer, advisor, or a Jew? I'm not particularly fond on the idea of a rules advisor. Sometimes a dungeon master makes mistakes or changes the ruling, but at the end of the day, it's their game. Let them do their thing. I'm inclined to agree with you on this, Barack. However, this was merely a clarification on a particular monster which, for the purpose of this campaign, is relevant. I will allow Mr. Shapiro to act as the rules advisor for the time being. However, I ask in future for you to hold any advising until we are between sessions. Thank you, Dungeon Master. I will respect your ruling on this. Can we get on with the session now? I'm itching for some action. Yes, let us continue. You are standing on top a hill, looking down at the town of Greenest, which we have established is being attacked by a blue dragon. The fruit merchant who you had hitched a ride with is sitting on top of his wagon, quietly weeping at the horrific sight which lays ahead. Those poor people, they're doomed. Not if I can help it. I see now that this is what I was sent here for, to protect all those people from that big ass dragon. They shall know this night as dragons fall when I drive my ax into that monster's skull. I think I had you wrong, Stomp. You seem like you have a good heart. Then I'll get all the bitches. I spoke too soon. I turn to the merchant. Will you take us the rest of the way? It still looks pretty far to go on foot. The merchant looks shocked at your words. Take you the rest of the way? Are you crazy? I'm turning around and getting out of here before that dragon sees me and my horse and decides it's hungry. I reach up and rest my hand on the gnomes. Please, good sir, the sooner we can get there, the sooner we can help those people and maybe even do something about that dragon. You don't have to take us all the way, but your assistance will greatly help our chances of saving more lives. Roll me a persuasion check. Though it is dark, you can see the milky and now watery eyes of the gnome. Your words do seem to have had an effect on him as he sniffs loudly, rubbing his nose with his ragged sleeve. He straightens up and looks at you all. Very well, get back on and hold tight. We're going to be going fast. I'll take you to the edge of the town, but I will not stop. You'll need to jump as we pass it. Thank you. I get back in the wagon and call to the others. Let's go. I climb in as well. Same here. I do too. But as I climb in, I call to the fellow gnome. What's your name? The merchant jerks the reins and the horse takes off at full speed. He calls back to you over the rushing wind and loud hooves. I am Odbin Sticklefinger. As I try to remain seated, I contemplate my dreams. Given what we could see over Greenest, I believe I was right to come here. I hope you all have the skills required for what is to be a truly difficult battle. The horse charges onward, and after a short while, Odbin calls out to you. Get ready to jump! I think I speak for all of us when I say we're ready. You feel the wagon start to turn to the right, and you can see a few houses which have not yet been set on fire. Odbin calls out, jump now! Everyone roll me a dexterity check. Come oh, on, shit. man. My first roll. It's about damn time. Swolnald is successful with jumping off the wagon and landing without hurting himself. There was never any doubt. The rest of you, however, take one D4 fall damage. As you hit the ground hard and lose your balance, tumble and land on either your front or back, you take maximum damage of four. I cast Healing Word on myself, using up one of my two spell slots. I look down at this sorry excuse of would-be heroes and say to them, pick your teeth up off the floor and follow me. The squishy ones cover our ass. Beard face, you're with me out front. Time to see if you're as tough as you make out to be. No sooner as you say this do you hear a door bang open and hurried footsteps, followed by grunting and snarling and even more footsteps. A terrified voice calls out, Help me! Someone please help me! That'll be us then. Let's go. You run forward to the sound of the calls for help and see before you a young woman with blonde hair. She is wielding a shield and a broken spear. Surrounding her are six creatures of small stature with a reddish reptilian-like skin. 
You would recognize these as kobolds. Ugh, kobolds. Such vile creatures. They must be in league with the dragon. I shout at the kobolds, get away from her, and I throw my hand axe at the nearest one to me. As you have the upper hand, roll with advantage. Roll to attack. Your axe lands in between its shoulder blades. Roll for damage. The kobold falls forward and lays motionless on the ground. This catches the attention of the rest and they turn to face you, drawing out their daggers as they do. Everyone, roll for initiative. You're up first, Bama. I slap my hands together and begin rubbing them. When I part my palms, three glowing darts form in the space between. Targeting the kobolds on either side of the woman, I shout, magic missile, sending the two lowest damaging attacks to the one on the left and the highest damage to the one on the right. Your missiles are successful in taking out both of the kobolds. The one on the right falls instantly after impact. The one on the left took the first hit, but the second finished it off. I finish my turn after moving five feet back and to the left. It is now the young woman's turn, and with her broken spear, she attempts to strike the kobold directly behind her. Holy crap. Natural 20, baby. Let's go. I call dibs. With a single movement and an angry war cry, inspired by your action so far, she thrusts the jagged piece of the remaining spear into the kobold's neck, and it slumps to the ground with the spear embedded. My nipples begin to throb at the beautiful carnage I witness before me. You mean your characters, right? Right? Take your turn, Ben. I, uh, cast Firebolt at the one furthest away. That doesn't look good. Not all of us are destined for greatness. Unfortunately, Ben, that does not hit. Failing to maintain discipline with the art of spellcasting resorted to the Firebolt sailing over the kobold's head and landing some 10 feet behind it. Crap, that'll be my turn done. You're getting too easily distracted, Shapiro. Let me show you how us pros do it. Raising my great axe in the air, I charge the kobold nearest to me. Fuck yeah. As I swing at this puny excuse of a lizard, I smile at the young lady and say, hey, wanna compare nipples? Your great axe cuts through the kobold like a hot knife through butter, slicing it clean across the midsection. The top half slides to one side and drops to the ground as blood spurts out the top, splattering both you and the young woman. I smooth my hair back and give her a radiant smile, ending my turn. Okay, Joe, you're up. I draw my long sword and charge at the remaining kobold. I, too, will smile at the young lady as I pass her and plunge my sword into the monster's face. That's not going to be enough to hit it. Your attention on the young woman has made you lose focus, and the kobold was able to sidestep your attack. Oh, shit. It is now the kobold's turn. And after seeing how most of you made quick work of his pack, he takes the disengage action and flees into the town. Nice, we still won. The young woman looks between Swolnald and Gurmly, and then at Sharpen and Bama. Thank you all so much for saving my life, but I must be going. It is clearly dangerous around here. It would not be safe to travel alone. I agree, especially with that dragon flying overhead. It would be wiser to flee from this town and seek shelter elsewhere. The woman's eyes widen but you don't understand. I must get to the keep, the stronghold of our town. It is where my husband and children have seeked shelter. No longer do my nipples throb. Is there someone in charge we could speak with at this keep? She nods vigorously. Yes, Governor Nighthill. He is the one who ordered everyone to seek refuge when the raids started. Then allow us to accompany you to the keep. We can protect you should we run into any more trouble. The woman tightens her shield strap around her forearm and takes a dagger from one of the dead kobolds. Very well. But we must be going now as they will be closing the entrance soon. Lead the way. The five of you begin to travel into the town of Greenest. And that gentleman is where we will end tonight's session. Wait, Dungeon Master, can we clarify a couple things before we end? Sure, Ben, like what? Before we head any further, do the kobolds have anything on them of any use? The woman picked up the only usable weapon and they carried no gold. One of them, however, had a piece of old parchment, which upon closer look is revealed to be a map of Greenest, although incomplete due to scorch marks and torn pieces. Did we get the young woman's name? Not yet, so you could ask her on the way to the keep next session. Did we get any experience for this session? Ah, 
You have reminded me we hadn't discussed how experience and leveling will work in this campaign. This adventure is broken down into chapters. At the end of each, you will all level up. So for now, Donald, no experience. So about the same amount as you have with picking up women. Careful, Squishy Elf, for next session, I'll turn my attention onto you. Will you be using your throbbing nipples? Hey, you would be amazed at how many chicks that has worked on for me. If it was more than zero, I would be astounded. Good evening, gentlemen. Are you all ready for tonight's session? Ready when you are, Dungeon Master. I've got my notes from last session. Nerd. Are you not taking notes? Don't need them. I've got what the kids call big brain. I remember all the important information worth remembering. Then you'll have no problem in recapping last session for us. You got it, boss man. Check it. Last session, we were on a wagon with an old geezer who launched us into the entrance of a beat-up town. I gracefully leapt out of the wagon like a swan, while the others did a Biden classic all over the dirt. Then this hot-ass broad was like, ooh, help me. She was surrounded by like 100 giants. Then I came to the rescue with my super swollenness and flexed my way through the lot of them single-handedly making them run like the punk ass bitches they are. The chick was super stoked on me and we made sweet love right then and there while the others chanted my name. Then Gurmley got AIDS and shit himself to death. I, I think I'm having memory issues. I don't remember this happening. Does this mean I need to create a new character? Don't worry, Joe. Donald is just messing with us. That's not what happened. Oh, good. I like my character. Someone should. Allow me to recap. We arrived at the edge of Greenest that is being attacked by a blue dragon. Upon arriving, we encountered several kobolds attempting to attack a woman. Between us, we defeated them, the last running away. She told us she is heading to the town's stronghold, The Keep, where the town's governor, Nighthill, resides. We are now accompanying her there. Very good. And so let us continue on with tonight's session. Wait, I just realized, t totally on my own, without anyone pointing it out like on a YouTube comment or anything. My AC is wrong. Damn, roll 20 must have messed up or something. It says 13, but it is in fact 17 due to my unarmored defense. Wow, such an obvious mistake. You sure you've played D&D before? Spend five minutes on YouTube and you'll see I'm all over the D&D world. Now let's get on with it. You are walking on from the entrance of the town, following the young woman whom you saved from the kobolds. She has led you on a path between thick sets of trees which seem to muffle slightly the sounds of people screaming and the roaring fires. I walk out in front with my sword drawn. I walk alongside the woman. Excuse me, but I don't believe we have exchanged names. I am Bama the Wise, and these are Gurmly Whitebeard, Swolnold Stomp, and Sharpen Faxbitter. My name is Lillian Swift. She glances over her shoulder for a moment before continuing. You all have such interesting sounding names. You must not be from around these parts. Indeed, we do not know much of this place and even less of what has been happening. Can you tell us all that you know? You can see the expression on her face stiffen. All I really know is a dragon appeared in the sky along with many horrid lizard-like creatures and men in robes. They attacked and ransacked everything and everyone they could find. I glance back when Lillian mentions men in robes. Was there anything more you can tell us about these men in robes? They seem to be ordering the lizard things, kobolds you called them. They were wearing black robes, but I did see one wearing purple. Purple may mean something, so I walk alongside Lillian. Do you know if these robe wearers are part of the cult of the dragon? She stops walking for a moment. The cult of the dragon. I had heard stories of them, but I've never seen any before. They could be the ones attacking the town, but I don't know for sure. We're wasting time with asking this chick stuff she clearly doesn't know. But this thing with the purple robes, would we know what that's about? I'll need a history check from one of you. I've got high intelligence, so I should roll for this. With your high intelligence and vast knowledge, you know a small shred of information regarding to the cult of the dragon and the significance of those that wear purple. It signifies authority of some kind and potentially a high threat level. You all are fortunate to have such a wise gnome such as myself. The fact that only some individuals wear purple confirms to me that we are indeed dealing with the cult of the dragon. They are like their leaders. Be warned, they are more deadly than the grunts. Personally, I love the idea of a challenge. If we encounter one of these purple wearers, I say we fuck them up. I agree with you, Swole. They won't be a match for us. Lillian, how much longer will it take us to get to the keep? Not much further now. We're nearing the edge of the forest, then over a stream, 
a short walk through the town streets and the keep sits on top of a hill to the east. As you continue walking, I want a perception check from all of you. Nice. Not bad. Oh, man. Dirty 20. That's good, right? Bama and Swolnald. You both can hear raised voices up ahead, but are unable to make out what is being said. Sharpen. You can hear much clearer than the others and can tell what is being spoken. Gormley. You are unaware of any noises other than your own footsteps. I stop walking and hold my hand up to signal the others. I would have also stopped at the sound of unknown voices. Same here. I would also run forward and throw out one of my perfectly sculpted arms in front of Lillian to prevent her from walking any further. I say quietly to her, something's up ahead. I was out in front of the rest, so would I have noticed that they stopped? Good question. I would say no, considering your back is to them. I say in a loud whisper, Gormley, stop walking. What's wrong? There's someone up ahead. Wait a moment. That's a terrible whisper. What can I hear? You can hear two voices, male and speaking in Draconic. Excellent. I speak Draconic. Same here. Even so, only Sharpen can hear what they're saying. The Southwest has been nearly picked clean. How goes it with the Southeast? More or less the same. I thought this town held better stock. It will not make for a great horde at this rate. Let us continue on. It is time we take the east side. You hear a third person approach. The other two go silent for a moment. You're meant to use your right hand, initiate, and have your palm facing forward. Are you trying to insult us with this poor excuse of a greet? No, sir. I, I'm sorry, but it is five fingers out, correct? Always. Initiate. You just came from the west tree line, but you were assigned to cover the south. Explain yourself. I saw a party of strange-looking individuals enter the town. They attacked the south team and killed all but one of them. I stayed in the shadows and decided it would be wiser to move around the forest and come warn my brothers. They could be heading this way. Good thinking, initiate. Keep this up and someday you may make the rank of Dragon Claw. We will have to inform Mondath of this development. She will be most interested to know of outsiders interfering. But not as much as Kyanrath will be. But now we should move on. Quickly across the stream, break the dam and make it harder for anyone else to cross. You hear the voices growing fainter as the three men walk away. I tell the others what I had heard. There's a lot to unravel there, but maybe we should get moving if they're messing with the stream. And a short while later, you find yourselves on the edge of the trees. All you can see is thick gray smoke. The sounds of screams becoming louder and clearer, as well as the burning of many haystacks and homes. You also notice the sound of rushing water some five feet from you. All the fire must be causing this smoke We'll never see the keep, let alone reach it. Once we're over the stream, I know where we need to go. We'll be fine so long as we don't separate. She stands still for a moment, examining the stream. The current is heavier than usual. It must have been those men you heard earlier. I think they wrecked the dam, holding back most of the water. I begin to walk across. When you attempt to cross, I want you all to make strength checks. Ah, shit. What's wrong? I have a negative two to my strength. I don't imagine this will go well for me. I could carry you. My character has more dignity than that, Joe. There's no damn way he'll be carried. No, I'll leave it to the dice of fate. I'll go first and I'll carry Lillian across. Yeah, baby, nice high number. That's a success. Right, boss man? Indeed it is, Donald, and you stride across the stream with no concerns. You hardly notice the water at all. If it weren't for the fact it was cold and wet, you wouldn't have known you were walking through it. That's how swollen all rolls. I'll go next. <laughs> that was better than Swannels. You too move across the stream with ease, making hardly a sound as you move swiftly across. I'll go next. Uh-oh, what does a 12 do? It narrowly avoids a fail. You do make it across, but the stream is picked up a little and you stumble a couple of times, getting yourself covered in water. I stand on the other side of the stream and avoid eye contact with the other two, turning my attention onto Bama. You got this! Okay, here we go. Fuck. Oh no. That's not good. Oh yeah, how much is he fucked? Given your size and the increasing strength of the current, Barack, Bama loses his balance and falls onto his back and is swept away along the stream. Help me! Do we really have time to be doing this? We have to hurry to the keep. Are you seriously contemplating leaving me behind, you asshole? How deep is this stream? About three feet. <laughs> really? That's it? 
I'll save you, Bam Bam. And I jump into the stream and grab him. Give me another strength check. God bless him, Mary. You fucking cunt. The current is now too strong for you also, and you too are swept up and carried away. Guys, my swollenness wasn't enough. Please help us. Come on, that's half the party, Donald. I better not regret this. Fine, I run along the bank and reach out to grab them both. I'm going to help as well. As you're assisting, Donald, roll me an athletics check with advantage. You're only just able to successfully grab onto the two in the water. Had it not been for Sharpen's help, you would have failed, and their bodies would have been found sometime later, lifeless and still. That was some sweet teamwork. Good job, Sharpen. We just need to work on those scrawny noodles you have there, and maybe one day you two can look as awesome as me. You could just say thanks for helping me out. I just did. Learn to take a compliment. Er, right. How are you two doing? I wipe my face with a cloth. I've been better, but I'll live another day. I do not answer this. Instead, I walk towards Lillian, who I assume is still with us. She is, yes. How much further now? I would very much like to get somewhere to dry off. Lillian raises her arm and points behind you. Although there is still plenty of smoke, you can make out a large structure on what is clearly a hill, roughly 100 feet from where you stand. Excellent. I straighten my hat and begin striding towards it, calling back to the others. Let's go, no time to waste. I guess he doesn't want to acknowledge what just happened, and I follow behind. I'm not letting him forget about it and begin walking towards the keep. I shake my head, but I also head towards the keep. You begin to climb the increasingly steep hill with the thickness of the smoke that continues to linger all around you and the night sky obscured by clouds it is impossible to see clearly. Although there appears to be dim light before you, possibly torches fitted around the outer wall of the keep. You walk towards them until finally the ground levels out. A noise hits your ears, not of screaming, but of angry yells and jeers, snarls and cackling laughter. But as you still cannot see clearly, it is impossible to tell what's causing it, only that it seems to be all around you. Suddenly, you hear the roar of the blue dragon as it swoops overhead, sending much of the smoke into a swirl, temporarily lifting it around you. You find yourself surrounded by a dozen kobolds, spears in hand, and all glaring at you, some smiling. The smoke descends back over you all, throwing you back into imperceptible vision. Roll for initiative. Holy shit, how did we not see these guys? I mean, I get why Sleepy Joe didn't notice them, but come on. We've got to protect the squishies, especially Bam Bam. What? Why especially me? You nearly drowned. You're fragile right now. Guys, I'm fine. He's right, Bama. If I hadn't single-handedly saved you. I helped as well. Single-handedly saved you. You would be some fish's bitch right now. I had to cradle your weak body in my majestic arms and allow you to suckle on my teat of awesomeness. Okay, that's enough. You need me, Bama? I really don't. It it's okay to lean on others for help, Bam Bam. It's okay that you're weak. I am not weak. You did fail pretty hard at crossing the stream. Even this chick gets it. Hold on. You think my character is female? Obviously. Look at that character art. A waifu if ever I saw one. A what? It's pronounced oo-woo. Anyway, we've got our work cut out for us, Swole. Indeed, Whitehead. Two broads and a weak-ass gnome to protect against 12 of these fuckers. I reckon I could fit the baby-sized gnome under my arm while I- Enough! You want to see what I can do? I'll fucking show you. I move forward, in front of Gormley. I clap my hands together and begin rubbing furiously as I walk. When I part them, a distinct sound of thunder emits from my body and sparks begin to flash about my hands. Thunder wave! You successfully send a thunderous wave of force at the three kobolds in front of you, obliterating them where they stand. What bits remain of them are scattered to the darkness. I end my turn by moving back and in between Gurmley, Sharpen, and Lillian. As I walk back past Gurmley, I say to him, top that, you punk bitch. Lillian, who has been focusing on the kobolds in front of her, charges forward and wielding the dagger she picked up earlier, makes an attack to the one on her left. Take it out! Her dagger slices into the kobold's neck, and she retreats back as it collapses onto the ground with fresh blood spreading out around it. This is looking good. At this rate, we'll take them all out in no time. And now for the kobolds. The two closest to Gurmley rush forward with their own daggers. The one on the right reaches you first. 
Come on, man. Really? Maximum damage? Hang on. I should have one more HP. I've only taken four damage since we started. I'm just going to fix that. An easy enough mistake to make. Let's see if it'll make a difference with the second kobold's attack. This one gets advantage due to pack tactics. Noise. The next kobold attacks Lillian and also gets pack tactics. It succeeds in cutting Lillian's arm, drawing blood. It cackles as drops splatter the ground. How is she holding up? Another hit like that and she won't be able to stay conscious due to too much blood loss. Hang in there, Lillian. The next kobold attacks Sharpen. Those bastard kobolds. Leave the women alone. I really hate you sometimes. This kobold is also successful and you feel a sharp pain across your chest and notice your clothes turning red. What is up with this max damage bullshit, Dungeon Master? You trying to kill us? Not intentionally, Donald. It is the way of the dice. I took a solemn vow never to fudge my rolls. Now prepare yourself swole nauled as the remaining four attack you. The fuck? Ha! It's going to take a lot more than that to pierce my magnificent skin. Oh no, my magnificent skin? Uh, I may be in trouble, guys. But you're so strong, Swolnald. Maybe your nipples will save you. You mock them, but they are the source of my power. Each one can deliver massive damage. Before the next kobold attacks, I use Stone's Endurance to reduce the damage it may send my way. There, you see? Saved by my mighty nipples. I wouldn't keep talking about them while the kobolds are attacking you, Stomp. They might actually believe you. Why did that one laugh? Because after hearing Bama's comment, he aimed to slice off one of your nipples and succeeded. And, uh, ah! Swole, talk to me, bro. You okay? No! No, I'm not! You see, Swole Nald grab his head with both hands as he flails on the spot. Then you notice how his muscles begin to bulge and twitch. Thick, meaty veins throb all over him, and you can almost hear a pulse coming from his body. His shoulder pads fall off, unable to stay in place, and when he removes his hands, you can see pure hatred. What the hell is happening? It's rage. He's gone full-blown rage. Oh yeah, baby. It's time to party. Before you do, though, it's my turn to shine. I cast Firebolt at the one that attacked me. Although your spell does make contact, it is not enough to finish off the kobold. It has, however, burnt a large section of its face and it snarls at you, baring its teeth. That's all I can do for now. Then it is time to show you my true power. I use rage, which for those of you who don't know makes me a fucking badass. I swing my mighty great ax at the kobold to my top right. Your attack cuts the kobold's head clean off and its body falls to the ground. Fuck yeah. I end my turn with Swolnold beating his chest and roaring into the night sky. As a bonus action, I use Second Wind, restoring four hit points. I will then attack the kobold on the right. Nice. nice. Your longsword cuts down the kobold with ease, like tearing a sheet of tissue paper. All right, let's keep this going. Bam, bam, unleash hell on them like you did last time. I can't do that right now, but I can do this. I cast Firebolt at the one attacking Sharper. Your firebolt narrowly misses as it saw you preparing the attack and was able to dodge it. Damn, that's me done for now. Lillian goes in for her next attack and also cuts this one's jugular, blood spraying across her face. This chick is amazing. We may have to replace your character, Ben. I'm not sexist, but I can't have more than two broads on our party. I don't know how else I can tell you this. My character is a dude. Just you wait until my turn. I've still got things I can do that will show you my worth. Now for the kobolds, the first one attacks Gurmly. You haven't done a single thing of use so far, Shapiro, whereas the other chick has already taken down, what, three kobolds so far? The next one will attack Sharpen. Just you wait, Donald, and all of you, should you have any doubt. You'll see that I have great skill and power. Ben, your character has taken enough damage that you are knocked unconscious. Ugh, this fucking sucks. The remaining three attack Swolnald, all with advantage. Bring it on. With my mighty rage, I'll have all damage they can throw at me. As you have no more stones endurance, I will have all three roll their attack at once. From left to right, they slash at you with their daggers. You take three piercing from the first, nothing from the second, and two piercing from the third, bringing your HP down to four. Oh man, that's pretty cool. I may have to take a level in Barbarian. Don't you even think about it. Okay, Ben. Roll me your first death save, remember. 
9 to 19 counts as one save. Nat 20 counts as two. Two to eight counts as one fail. And a nat one counts as two fails. You need three successes to stabilize or three fails to die. I'll have to accept whatever the outcome, as will you. Don't fail me now, Dice! Woo! That's one. You're up, Donald. Way ahead of you, boss man. I swing at the one on the right with my great axe. Are you fucking kidding me? The kobold was ready for you and was able to duck out of the way as you brought your axe down. Let's see if I have better luck with the kobold on the left. Your sword plunges into the kobold's face and out the top, splitting its skull in half. I move down and next to Swole to help him. I don't need your help, Biden. My character's swollenness will reign supreme over these shitty lizards. Well, just in case, I'm staying side by side. I shall cast Firebolt at the one who attacked Ben again. Oh, come on. This isn't going well for us guys. Good thing we have Lillian here. That chick is just straight up owning the fight. Speaking of, Lillian moves towards the nearest kobold and attempts to stab it in the throat. She succeeds and it too falls to the ground. She then moves towards the rest of the kobolds and stands by Gurmly. Stay close to me, I say to her as I eye up the kobold in front of me. The kobold on the left attacks Gurmly, dealing four damage. The other two attack Swole Nald. And even with Rage's ability, Donald, you are knocked unconscious. Oh, sweet January 6th, I think we're screwed, guys. Let's not give up. I've got my second death save roll. Nice, that's two. You're right, Shapiro. It isn't over until we're all as dead as Biden's presidency. Let's go death save roll. Fuck. I attacked the one in front of me. Another success, Joe. Your sword brings the kobold to its knees before it falls to the side. Am I seriously about to be saved by Biden? Believe it, Trump. We're a goddamn team. I'm also a part of this team. I move to the side by 10 feet and cast Firebolt. Are you fucking kidding me? It'll be okay, guys. We're getting all the shit rolls done with now. It means we'll get awesome ones later. There may not be a later. Midget fucking killjoy. I move back another 15 feet to avoid any close-up attacks once the rest of the party is dead. Lillian moves towards the kobold on the left and goes for another attack. And yet another success. This one falls down after a single blow from Lillian's dagger. A fucking goddess. She then moves next to the kobold in an attempt to stop it from attacking Swolnald, which works as it now focuses its attack on her. Swiping at her, it makes contact. No! Lillian falls to the ground unconscious. Okay, hopefully this will be my last roll. That means I'm okay, right? It means you have stabilized with one HP. Okay, great, so then I move. Hold up, Ben, you've stabilized. That's your turn over. Then I shall roll my next death save and rise like a majestic phoenix. This is bullshit. Sorry, Donald, that's two fails so far. One more or a successful attack from the kobold and that's your character done for. I'll get it. I charge around Swole's body and attack the kobold. Oh, no. Unfortunately, that isn't enough to hit it, Joe. Bam, bam. You got any ideas? Firebolt. I think we've established you cannot use Firebolt well. Do something useful. I look up at the keep's walls and shout as loud as I can. Help us, kobolds attacking, help us. You hear nothing in return. Meanwhile, I will roll for Lillian's death save. It's a nat one. That's two fails. The kobold attacks Gurmly. Oh shit. Indeed. Gurmly has been taken down by the remaining kobold. You better not miss this time, Shapiro. Firebolt! How do you want to do this? Let's go! Fuck yeah. It's about damn time. I raise my hand into the air, close my eyes and clench my fist. Flames erupt around my hand as I scream, Firebolt! The flame flies across the air, right into the kobold's open mouth and his head explodes from the intense heat. Congratulations. You have managed to defeat the first wave of kobolds outside of the keep. Yeah, we did a great. Hold on, first wave, as in there are more coming? Oh yes. In fact, you can hear them running up the hill towards you. Maybe two dozen this time. We've got to run. Where to? And what about the others? I run towards the front doors of the keep and bang on them as loud as I can. Open the fucking doors! I tried shouting and it didn't work. Let's try together. With the two of you both shouting, you hear a voice above you. Back off, you cultist bastards, or we'll rain down a shower of arrows upon you. I call up, we're not cultists. We're escorting Lillian Swift, one of your people. She is hurt, as is our group. We've defeated the kobolds here, but more are coming. Please let us in. Roll me a persuasion check. I'm gonna help to give him advantage. There's a moment's silence 
followed by heavy sounds of grunts and odd, slightly mechanical noises. The front doors open and several men clad in armor rush out. Most of them run past you and set up a defensive line. A few others run and grab the unconscious party members and a single dwarf with a red beard stands in front of you both. He looks you both up and down. One false move from any of you and we'll throw you off the rooftop. Now get inside quick. Good evening, gentlemen. Are you ready to continue? Holy shit, that was close. I thought my days as Swolnald were over and we've hardly begun this campaign. Yeah, I thought we had that fight in the bag. What went wrong? Allow me to recap for you, Joe. Maybe someone else should. Check it. We had saved that sweet ass broad Lilliput. Lillian. From the lizard freaks. And we're walking through a forest when the elf chick. Not a chick. Overheard some shit not worth mentioning. We came to a puddle on the path. I walked over carrying Louise. Lillian. Getting a quick feel of each other's nipples as we did. The elf chick. Not a chick. Barely made it over when she got herself wet at the sight of my pulsing muscles. Then Midget. Killed Joy failed harder than the guy who conducted the Wuhan's lab's health and safety inspection and began to sink in two inches of water. Gurmley dove in and drowned for some reason, only using 1% of my power in my pinky finger. I lifted both him and the gnome out. I bitch slapped the life back into Gurmley. We got to Lithuanian's Lillian. house, the Cope, and were greeted by more lizard fucktards. The battle was long and fierce. Gurmley, the elf chick, not a chick, and Lucy, Lillian, all went down faster than a cheap hooker. The gnome hid in a corner and cried at his terrible magic abilities. Then, one of those dermatitis riddled hobbits tried to tickle my nipple. That's when I went super fucking say in and destroyed them all with a single flex of my dick. More started coming after me from down the hill, but I wasn't interested anymore. They weren't worthy of my time. So I picked up the elf chick. Not a chick. Laxative. Lillian. The now soiled Gurmley and the crying bitch gnome kicked the door down of the cope and casually walked inside. Oh yeah, and there was some soulless ginger dwarf and some dudes in tinfoil armor. That was interesting, Donald. Thank you for that recap. Now let us continue. The dwarf steps aside and gestures you in. As you both hurry forward, you see him grip his warhammer tightly. You notice his eyes are fixed on something behind you. The guards carry your unconscious party members. One has Lillian over his shoulder, two have one of each of Gurmless arms over them and his feet drag along the dirt. It took five guards to lift Swolnald. His head flops from side to side as the guards struggle with his immense size and weight. To think it takes five guys to carry my hulking mass of perfection. Two of them just to carry my dick. You're standing in a large stone courtyard. Moss over grows on many of the walls. Small archways, some with wooden doors, surround you. At the far end of the keep, you can see a tall tower, with the moon slowly coming in and out of focus as smoke continues to engulf the town. The dwarf is seen barking orders at the guards while keeping his eyes fixed on the approaching mass. Quickly now, get the wounded to the infirmary. I want archers up top and get that gate closed now. With a metallic clinking sound, you hear chains moving as the doors begin to shut. You can see into the darkness and smoke due to many torches being held by what looks like 20 or so kobolds. Their teeth bared, their spears or daggers glint off of the small fires and all of them cackling. Their pace is fast. When they're only 15 feet from the gate, you hear a snarl, quite audible over the kobolds. They come to a complete stop and go silent. Just as the doors close, you see a set of piercing red eyes, long teeth and blue scaly skin. I want Sharpen and Bama to roll a constitution check. You both feel a wave of fear unlike anything you have felt before. Your bodies shake at what you saw. You try to control your breathing to stop yourselves from fainting. The dwarf notices your panic. It's all right, lads. Nothing is getting through that gate. Did you see that just now? What was that? Would I have seen this thing before? Roll me a history check. You wouldn't have seen this particular thing before, but you recognize the features from a book you had been reading once. You realize it was a blue half-dragon. You better hope those doors hold, Sir Dwarf. They have a half-dragon with them. Fear not, young elf. Our gates have stopped worse from entering. Now, you must follow me to see the governor. I'm already here, Escobert. Standing before you is a tall human male, gray hair tied up, his best years not completely behind him. 
his blue clothing stained with blood and a tired expression upon his wrinkled face. He smiles at you both. Welcome, travelers. I'm Governor Nighthill, and this is Escobar the Red, Master of the Keep. I give a nod to Night Hill. I am Bama the Wise, and this is Sharp and Fact Spitter. We need to see our companions and make sure they are all right. Yes, of course, but I have seen your friends being brought in, along with one of our own. They would be attended to right now by our clerics. Best to leave them, just for now. I have some questions I would like to ask you. We have some questions for you as well. Firstly, just what is going on in this town? A grave expression falls over Night Hill's face. It started around midday. A blue dragon came from the skies and began wreaking havoc on us. It tore our homes apart and brought the elements of lightning with it. While we did everything we could to attempt to stop it, we were then attacked from the ground. Hordes of kobolds killed so many of our people and set fire to our haystacks and houses. There were also another group, all wearing black robes. In all the chaos, we lost many good soldiers and more civilians than we have been able to keep track of. The best we have been able to do is to get everyone into the town's three most defensible strongholds, the mill, the temple, and here. It was a coordinated attack. The dragon and kobolds are working with the cult of the dragon. Our latest reports tell us they are taking every piece of wealth we have. Some of the robe wearers have been seen leaving the town once they have taken their fill. I would give anything to have one of their leaders here right now. I would get all the answers I seek out of them. Escobar grips his warhammer again, looking furious. Try to remain calm, my friend. As Night Hill lays a hand on the dwarf's shoulder, I have a question for you two. I saw you from the tower fighting those kobolds and I can tell you all possess great abilities of which we could do with. Would you be so kind as to use them once again and help the townspeople? I don't know how much more we, and I gesture to myself, and Sharpen can actually help with. We have used up our magic and required to rest for a long period of time. Our companions are also badly beaten, and they too would require a long time to recoup. Hmm. The governor dips his head slightly with his hand over his chin, stroking his beard. Perhaps we can help with that. First, go see your friends. The clerics should have healed the worst of the injuries, then head through that door over there. He points at a particularly small-sized door. We have an alchemist. Bit of an odd fellow, but a genius with potions. He may be able to help you. After which, come see us, and we can go over what we require from you. Thank you. We will be back shortly. And I head in the direction where they took the others. Governor, has there been any reports of a female elf with long red hair seen in this town? The governor ponders for a moment. I'm sorry, but you are the only elf I have seen, let alone heard of today. I shall ask my guards to keep an eye out, though. I catch up with Bama and head with him to the infirmary. You seem oddly concerned for the two we traveled with. You didn't strike me as the type who cared for others, or at least those two. I feel somewhat responsible for what has happened to them and to Lillian. And for that matter, yourself. Had I not been blinded by pride and just allowed myself the lack of dignity to be carried across that stream, we could have reached the keep before they closed up and might have not had to fight those kobolds. I stopped walking for a moment and bowed deeply to Sharpen. Please forgive me. You had nearly died as well. I put a hand out to Bama. All is forgiven from me, Sir Wizard. Mistakes were made, but the others will be fine, and so no harm, no foul. But perhaps in future, we avoid these situations and trust in each other to help. It is something I should have considered during that fight. I shake Sharpen's hand. You seem to do everything you could. Not everything. I still had enough magic to heal someone, but I selfishly held on to it for myself. From now on, I shall think more of the ones who head straight into danger. You reach a door with a sign of a medical cross over the arch. Inside are several beds, most taken with unknown people, blood stained with limbs missing. On one of the beds, you see Lillian, eyes closed. Oh, please don't be dead. I rush forward towards her side. As you do, Swolnald grabs you by the back of your cloak, lifts you off the ground, slams you into the wall, and pins you by your throat. I want you both to roll a strength check. What the fuck? Hold up. Why is he doing that? And why did you not describe him being there? You spoke over me before I could finish my sentence. I was going to say, Swolnald and Gurmley are both standing at the other end of the room. As for Swolnald's action, I passed Donald a note to let him know what happened to Lillian. And he asked me if his character could do this. Come on, Brock, let's roll, baby. Well, what is the meaning of this? 
I hurry forward. Swole, stop this. I run at Swole and attempt to pull him off Bama. Then you two can roll me a strength check. Donald, one more time from you as well. Gurmley is unable to budge Swolnald and Bama. You just hang there, choking, several feet off the ground. You fucking caused this. You and your damn weak ass. I should have just left you to drown. But because we spent time on you, Lillian, I go quiet and tighten my grip. But the clerics, couldn't they do something? The clerics were unable to save her. They went to find her family. We said we would wait here with her. Please let him go, Swole. The damage has been done. Don't make me use this. And I draw my longsword and point it at him. Joe, roll me a persuasion check. Donald, roll me a straight D20. I loosen my grip and allow Bama to slide to the floor. Then I place hands on either side of him and lower my face to his. You lose me another babe and I'll kill you where you stand. One of the clerics walks into the room, looks to Gurmley and shakes her head. It seems none of her family made it to the keep. They're either still in the town, hopefully having found somewhere to hide like the temple, or she doesn't finish her sentence and walks over to Lillian, lifting the sheet and draping it over her face, then leaves the room. I'm sorry, everyone. I was foolish and let my pride get in the way. I make a promise to you today that will never happen again. I throw myself down onto my knees. Your words mean nothing to me, gnome and I walk out of the room. Let's get out of here. I begin walking towards the door. I say nothing and also leave the room. I take a moment to reflect, then I will walk out of the room, but not before resting my hand on Lily and saying quietly, I'm sorry. The four of you stand in the courtyard. You can hear the sounds of raging fire outside the keep, and you can see many civilians and guards moving around inside. There is no sign of Escobar or Night Hill. We should plan our next move. You should shut the hell up. Swole, Bama isn't entirely to blame for what happened. I share responsibility as well. I could have healed Lillian or either you or Gurmley, but I chose not to. If you're trying to make things better, Elf, you're doing a shit job. Why did you not heal anyone? I didn't know how long this situation would last and I needed to be well enough to save my friend. She is more important to me than a group of strangers I only met today. Well, we have been thrown into this together. There was no intention of being a group, but we have become one of sorts. Perhaps once the danger has passed, we go our separate ways. I agree. I still have answers to seek here, but yes. Once these enemies of the town are dealt with, I shall seek them alone. Why bother waiting until then? I can't rely on any of you and these people need saving. I'll do it myself, and I walk away. Wait, Swole. Go fuck yourselves. For the time being, Swolnald has left the group. He has gone back to the infirmary. For now, let's plan our next move. Any suggestions? I've been thinking over what we know so far. There appears to be two groups, the cult and the kobolds, plus the dragon. And the half-dragon me and Bama saw outside the entrance to the keep. They attacked during the day, killing and stealing as they go. They have already cleared the southern part of Greenest. There are two names that came up when I heard those cult members talking, Mondath and Cian Rath. These may be the leaders who could also be wearing purple. The governor wants our help, but we don't know yet with what. And we're already drained from the previous fights, but the governor also mentioned seeing the town's alchemist for help with that. What sort of help could this alchemist provide? We're not sure, but he mentioned him when we said we needed to rest in order to get our strength and magic back. Let's go see him and see what he can offer. The three of you head for the smaller door the governor pointed out. Above it is a symbol of a bottle. I knock on the door. Enter! I push the door open. You find yourselves inside a quite messy room, full of glinting bottles stacked upon desks and on many shelves, all the way to the ceiling. Strange devices sit on the desks, some holding bottles of liquid, some with moving parts. The sound of a drip can be heard in several of these. Now and then a small noise like a pinwheel can be heard. Several clocks dotted around the room tick loudly. Various plants can be seen hanging from pots. Whiffs of odd-smelling aromas fill your nostrils. Sitting on a stool by one of the desks is an elderly gnome. He has a long white beard, spectacles that enhance his crooked eyes. He wears a brown top hat with a small pocket watch attached to the front. He looks ready for traveling as he is wearing a small backpack along with bags on his belt and a small waistcoat also with pocket watches. He tilts his head at you as you approach. Ointments and fizzle pop. I have customers, don't I see? Or do I? 
Uh, yes you do. Have customers, I mean. We were sent here by- Not time for your words right now. It's half past something already. Here. He had already got off his stool and pulled out three small sticks with a little red orb on the end. Put these into your speaking holes. He thrusts one into each of your hands. What are these? No time. Talking hole now. Should we really be doing this, guys? A stranger wants to give you something red and pointy to put in your mouth without question. I don't see what the problem is. Can I make an insight check to see if he is up to something evil? Go ahead. You can tell he has no intention of causing you harm or of anything evil. Okay, then I will go along with it. You take 56 D4 necrotic damage. What? what? Just kidding. You notice a sweet raspberry flavor from it and realize it's just a sucker. Hmm, thank you, but why are you giving us a sucker? You looked like you needed them. They help promote good spirits, but have too many, and they are an excellent laxative. I put mine in my pocket. Same here. Please, fellow gnome, we were sent here by Governor Nighthill. He believes you may be of some help to us. Oh, and what help is that then? Myself and my elf friend here need to rest for a long period of time in order to regain our strength. But with the current situation outside of the keep, we simply do not have the time. Is there something you can provide us that will help? The gnome's beard twitches for a moment. Oh, yes, indeed, I can help with that. Well, sort of. Or actually, no. Hmm. He rummages around one of the many shelves for a moment before holding out several small vials of light green liquid. You look closely and can see small sparks scatter themselves within the bottle and you hear a faint buzzing coming from them. These are one of my more experimental potions. I call them, uh, what was it now? Oh yes, elixir of time, although according to the last three that tried it, they called it a bloody disaster, but there's no pleasing everyone. Elixir of time? Bloody disaster? What exactly do they do? They trick time within your body, granting you the ability to regain full strength without the need to actually rest. That sounds amazing. I agree, that sounds almost too good to be true though. I'm thinking, considering you said the last three called them a disaster, what is the catch? Well, there are drawbacks or side effects, if you please. One fellow found that one of his ears fell off, another went blind, and the third couldn't talk. But they were Hadozi, so that may have been the reason. You see, I've not had many testers, so the drawbacks are unknown in their entirety. I had a dwarf who grew to 10 feet, and yet another dwarf shrank to 30 centimeters. One was male and one was female. I had two humans, both male. One gained gray hair immediately, and the other grew a bosom after a year. They were different ages. So you see, there's no telling what these will do to you. I see, and just how much are these going to cost? Wait, Bama, I grab his arm. You're not seriously considering taking one of these? Deadly serious. How much, sir? You may call me Terry Winkle Plum Pudding, and they are yours for nothing, as nothing is what you very well may have afterwards. Should you still live and be able to communicate, please let me know what, if any, side effects you received. Very good, I shall take three. And I scoop them out of Terry Winkle's hand, put them into my pocket, bow low, and head out the door. Do you have any regular healing potions? Yes, indeed, but these are not experimented on, so they're regularly priced at 50 gold. I'm a little short on funds. Could I get two off you and pay you back? Yes, I think we can come to an agreement on that. Let us shake on it. I put my hand out. You see that gnome has put both hands on his hip and started shaking his body. I copy him. And a deal has been made. Huzzah, here you go. And what about you, young elf? I'm okay, thanks. Good day, Mr. Plum Pudding. And I walk with Gurmly out the door. You walk out to find Bama waiting for you. And a little ways ahead, you see Swolnald with Nighthill and Escobird. Ah, excellent timing. We were just about to explain the plan to your Goliath friend here. I already told you, old man, I'm working solo. I have no friends in this town aside from my mighty great axe. We need all the help we can get. It would be in the people's best interest that you work with these three. I don't respond to this, but instead lean on my axe and give Bama a death stare. Tell us what you need from us, Governor. Come with us. They lead you to the base of the tower. Through the door, up a spiraling set of stairs, and you stand on the parapet. You can see the whole of Greenest, the many fires still burning. Over in the west, you can see a large windmill. Over to the east, a large structure similar to that of a church. You can also see the kobolds below in front of the gate with the half-dragon, whose eyes are fixed on you all. I mentioned earlier that we have two other strongholds, the mill and the temple. 
We've been receiving reports that a group of kobolds are using a battering ram to try and take down the gates at the temple. Many of our people are still inside as well as our most treasured relics. We also have another that suggests the mill is being attacked with fire. If that burns down, our food stock for the winter will go with it and we'll starve to death. We have enough resources to handle one of these situations. Could you help us with the other? We'll gladly pay you each 100 gold for your trouble. Which one do you want us to take care of? That is down to you. Simply let us know which one you will defend and we'll send our guards to the other. If they're successful and quick enough, we'll send them to you afterwards as backup. Just let us know. Governor! A guard who was stationed on one end of the parapet suddenly calls out. Dragon incoming! He points to the sky and you all look up to see the wide open jaw of the blue dragon. Its wings flapping with increased speed as it hurtles towards you. Roll for initiative. Oh shit, we're not ready for this. Just roll your dice, Shapiro. Worst case, we'll pimp you out to the dragon and the rest of us can just bail the fuck out of here. Asshole. Work together and you'll be fine. Let's fucking go! From where you stand, you can see the dragon above you. Hurtling towards you at great speed, its mouth is opening and the bright light of its electric breath weapon attack begins forming. Escobar pulls out a horn from his belt and blows deeply into it. You hear the many hurried footsteps of armor-clad soldiers running around below. He grabs Nighthill's arm and makes for the door of the tower. We're sitting ducks here. Guards are positioned around the wall tops. They'll try to draw its attention to give us time. Move! And they run at full speed towards the door and out of sight. We haven't got much time. I look at Swolnold. I know you don't trust me right now, but I hope my actions will change that. Depends on your actions, Gnome. It better be something epic. Those pads on Swole's shoulders, are they feathers or fur, Donald? A bit of both. Why? I jump up and grab one of the feathers off of the shoulder pads and begin running towards the ledge. You guys go. I'll draw its attention. What are you going to do? Something epic. I pull out one of the vials of Elixir of Time and consume it as a bonus action. As you drink the potion, you feel a surge of energy rush through your body. I'm going to pass you a note as to what the side effect is. Then I will cast Firebolt at the dragon. Your Firebolt is a direct hit on the dragon. This has indeed got its attention as it roars in anger. I leap over the side using the feather I cast, feather fall on myself, and as I fall, I look back and smile at the others. And your feather fall reaction takes effect as you descend over the ledge. Okay, I'll admit it, that is pretty badass. And you got a hit on the dragon, noise. What's the side effect of the potion? You'll find out soon enough, but for now I end my turn in a slow descent. The rest of you, fixed in position where you stand as you are in shock as to what you just saw, hear someone shout, Loose! And an array of arrows shoot into the sky at the approaching dragon. Most simply bounce off its scales, but one embeds itself into one of its nostrils. The dragon roars even louder and fires its electric breath at the soldiers, killing three on impact and severely injuring six more. It swoops low over the keep and begins ascending, beating its wings furiously. I run to the door. I don't think it's finished yet, but Bama and those soldiers just bought us some time to get off here. Let's go! And use my turn to run down the stairs. I stare for a moment at the slowly descending gnome before turning around and also using my turn to run down the stairs. At this time, I can't do a whole lot, so I will also use my turn to get downstairs. Bama. You have fallen 60 feet from the ledge of the tower and land on your feet onto the wall parapet that surrounds the keep without taking any fall damage. A few moments later, the others come running out of one of the doors of the tower. I smile at the others. Did you see that just now? You may be asking how? For I stand here with no damage upon my feet. This spell of mine is mighty neat. That was nicely put, but let's try focusing on what the dragon will do next, Bam Bam. Of course, we must prepare for its next attack. While it turns, I will shoot at its back. Then when it comes in for a bite, you and Swole can hit it with all your might. What the fuck has got into him? It must be the side effect of the potion he took. I shake my head at them. I don't know what you think you see, but there is nothing wrong with me. Come on, tiny gnome. You were starting to look as cool as my now deformed nip. Don't ruin it with all this rhyming shit. I have had enough of all this dribble. I can no longer remain civil. First you look down on me for being little, then to be compared to your missing nipple. My patience for you is becoming brittle. You want more of my power. Magic missile! 
Your missiles, one after the other, have enough range on them to make contact with the dragon, although slightly more than 100 feet away. Its roar is as loud as ever, as it is already turning back and coming straight for you. I end my turn by running and heading through the door that the others used. You see the soldiers that remain raise their bows, and as the dragon gets close, they fire as one. Another volley of arrows hit its face. This time three are successful at sticking, and the dragon crashes into the wall. It clings to the sides, its sharp claws piercing the stone, creating long cracks as it grips tightly. It's head high up above you all, and it glares down at the guards, opening its jaw wide. You see the intense light of its breath weapon. You can hear a charging-like sound as it ramps up. Several of the soldiers raise their swords and run at it, shouting as they do. The dragon blasts them apart, killing the six injured from before and injuring another five, leaving only six left. And yourselves, of course. It's close enough for us to hit it, Swole. Let's go. And I rush forward and strike at it with my longsword. You're successful and make contact. Your blade makes the tiniest of cuts on its scales and its eyes flash at you and lets out a strange growl, gurmly and sharpen. As you speak Draconic, you can understand what it is saying. Pathetic humans, this is not worth my time. Stay and fight, I yell at it. You came here to destroy this town, and now you want to run because someone stood against you? You are nowhere near strong enough for me to consider you a challenge. Fianrath wants his fun then he can have it. I have done what was asked of me. Who is Shanrath? What is it you want? If you're not going to fight us, then at least tell us what this is all about. Who do you think you puny mortals are in questioning me? We're the ones who will put a stop to all of this. Ha! A foolish notion. You cannot stop what has begun. She will rise and bring about an age of glory for all dragons and you mortals will burn to ash. And with that, the dragon beats his powerful wings, rips part of the wall he clung to into pieces, and flies up into the night sky. Wait, that's it? I didn't get to do anything? That's it. I feel like I was cheated out of an awesome fight. This is pretty bullshit. Donald, had I allowed a full-scale fight against this dragon, you would have all been killed in one hit. No exaggeration. It was pretty cool to have a small fight with a dragon this early on, though. Of course you would say that. You and Biden were the only ones who got to do a damn thing. I want some action. Don't worry, Donald. Something tells me you'll get your wish. Now, let us continue on. The soldiers that are unhurt begin lifting the injured. The door to the tower opens and Bama and Escobar walk through. Good job, lads. You sent that beast packing. It seemed more likely the beast didn't consider us much of anything and left. But it did mention Kyanrath. That name has come up before. Sharpen, did you get the feeling it was stalling for something? I don't know, maybe. I did what was asked of me. That's what it said, but all it's done is kill a handful of guards. Why not take down the whole keep? Its claws were ripping through this wall like it was nothing. And what did it mean when it said, she will rise? Who was it talking about? Has to be a dragon, the way it spoke suggests so. I feel we keep coming across more questions as the night goes on. I am getting a strange feeling about all this like it feels familiar in some way. We should probably talk about this in more detail. Why does it matter? The coward flew away because it knew I was about to kick its ass. Let's get back to what's more important right now. Oh, right, yeah, the mill or the temple, I think we- No one cares, I'm going to the mill. You losers do what you want. Fine, but we're going with you. Whatever, just don't get in my way. Escobar, we will go save the mill and protect your food supplies. Aye, laddie, I've got ears. We'll send our soldiers to the temple. Once they're done, they'll head to the mill to reinforce its defenses. Have you got a map? Yes, we do, although it's quite torn apart. I show him. He reaches inside his armor and pulls out a piece of parchment. Here, take this. It's not been damaged. There's a couple notes I've added to it which may be of use to you. Good luck, lads. Thank you. We still have a problem, though. How do we leave here? The front gate is heavily guarded by that half-dragon and kobolds. There's a series of tunnels that can get you out. Take these. He hands you several keys. I'll write down some instructions for you as well. Hang on. There. Follow that route and that should take you in the right direction. Won't take you the whole way though, but enough to get you past that wretched lot. Okay then, guys, let's go. 
I'll show you to the entrance to the tunnel. And he leads you to the base of the tower, out the door, across the courtyard, past Terry Winkles and the infirmary, to an iron gate with pitch black darkness behind it and a set of lit torches either side. He uses one of the many keys he still holds and you hear the loud squeak as he pulls the gate open. If you can't see in the dark, I suggest lighting some torches. And that there, gentlemen, is where we will end tonight's session. So I just did the equivalent of Biden's time in office. Sweet fuck all, should have stayed at home. Dungeon master, just how long am I gonna have to rhyme? Until you've completed a short rest, then the effects will wear off. You know, that wasn't so bad of a side effect. Perhaps I will get some of these potions before we head into the tunnel. Donald, you may wanna think about getting some healing potions as well. Why don't I just get a big old sign that says pussy while I'm at it? I'll pass. Swole don't need that. Swole don't need nothing but his ax and his nips. I think sooner or later, you're going to regret trying to go all edgy and solo and realize we need to be a team. Like that will ever happen. Well, before we call it a night, can we make a plan of what we're going to do next? I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen, Shapiro. We'll be smashing our way through any enemy that dares get in our way. We're going to save all the people. I'm going to get myself some fine-ass bitches. Obama is going to rhyme a whole lot, probably cringe the shit out of it, and cry about his pathetic magic. Biden's character will die from something like falling over a leaf. And you'll be sold off to a cult member to be a bride for some dick cheese smelling bandit. You really know how to paint a picture. I just tell it like it is. What I mean is, what exactly will we do next session? I think we need to start actually planning ahead. Otherwise, we'll just be winging it all the time. If I may, I have a suggestion. What have you got? First, we go see one of the clerics here and get fully healed up. Then back to Terry Winkles for more potions. He seems to be okay with delayed payments, so we could potentially stock up. He may even have other things we didn't think about asking for, like magical items. We need torches for those who don't have dark vision. I also think we should see if there are blacksmiths here. We could find better weapons. Once we have everything we could need, we head into the tunnel following the route Escobar gave us. Once we're back outside, we sneak over to the mill and assess the situation. If they have a lot of kobolds over there, then precautionary action would be better. By taking them out one by one instead of as a whole group, we'll lower our chances of getting overrun. Once the area is cleared, then we head into the mill and make sure everyone is safe. We would only then need to help fortify the barricades until Escobert's guards show up. I like the sound of that. Count me in. I do too. I also had an idea. Remember when those cult members were talking? They mentioned about a type of greeting, something like hand outstretched with all five fingers showing. What if we managed to find some cult members, steal their robes and pretended to be one of them? It might be easier to blend in. Can't believe I'm saying this, but that is actually a good idea. Now, I'm not one to be stealthy, but I, I kind of like the thought of kicking some cult members' asses and stealing their shit. We'll just need to find some first. I guess if we're surveying the area, we might hear some chatter about where some of them are. Then I think we're all in agreement for what to do next? Looks that way. I'm up for this plan. Fuck it, let's do this. I like that you're starting to show teamwork. This is good. You're gonna need it. Good evening, gentlemen. Are you ready for tonight's session? I'm definitely ready. Ben has a solid game plan for us, so I'm feeling confident. I'm looking forward to kicking the living shit out of some cult members. Let's go. I thought we were just fighting a dragon and about to go into a cave. That's not entirely accurate, Joe. At this point, is anyone surprised? Donald, remember my ruling about being civil. You got it, boss man. I will hold back just for you. Do you need another recap, Joe? No, I can do this. So we were in a temple and Hillary Clinton, the chief goblin, just released a Tarasque. That's our other campaign. We escaped onto a ship and Johnny Depp joined us for a while. That's the AI guy's campaign. I'm not even sure those two were linked. He kept flirting with Donald's female barbarian character a lot. Like fuck, I would ever be a female. I mean, I would get all the simps, of course, but that's Kokomimi's. Then I had a dream with some scary clown guy who stood still for a while, then suddenly started moving. That's, that's clones. clones. I woke up and we had made it to a town called Dunsmouth. That's not even D&D. Are we just going through all the other creators here? And that's where I caught my first Pokemon. You've nearly gone through them all here. It's like some fucked up creator bingo. Was there anything else you can remember? Why are you encouraging this? Oh yeah, there were lots of female politicians getting it on with Bill Clinton the Bard. I think that was it. Is that all of them? Are you done promoting? Squaw. I actually miss Donald's recapping. 
That wasn't so bad. I think I should do the recaps more often. Fight, urge to mock. Thank you, Joe, for that slightly strange recap. Now, I believe Barack mentioned Ben had a plan. You want to take the lead on this as it was your idea? First things first, I need to get healed up. Both Swole and Gormley already got that when they were taken into the keep, and Bama took that elixir of life potion. But I'm still on only one health point. After I think we should revisit Terry Winkles for more potions and see if he has anything else that might help us. Does the keep have a blacksmith? Yes, they do. Then we should check them out as well. As Bama and my character are the only ones with dark vision, we should get some torches. Once we're through the series of tunnels, we sneak up to the mill, scout the place out and see if we can take out any enemies quietly, or if we see any cult members. Beat them up and take their robes, then we can infiltrate undetected. Once we're inside, we secure the mill and wait for Escobert's reinforcements. All right then, let us continue on with tonight's session. You are standing in front of the open gate, which leads into the tunnel system. Escobar stands next to it, holding it open. Are you lads ready? Not quite, Sir Dwarf. We have a few things we would like to do before we head in. Very well. He shuts the gate and locks it. Can't be leaving this open. You could get lost easily in there. Let me know when you're ready to leave. I'm going to see the clerics for some healing, then over to Terry Winkles. Meet you guys there. I have all the potions I need, so I would like to check out the blacksmiths and also get some torches. I'll get enough for me and Swolnald. I have what I need, good elf. Go and heal your weary self. I shall wait at this iron gate, but do not dally as the hour grows late. I forgot about the rhyming. Sucks to be you right now. And what about you, Swolnald? Standing there tall and bold, will you choose to wait with me, or do you have somewhere else to be? As a matter of fact, tiny man, I do. I look at Escobar. Can we talk? And I gesture away from the others. Sure thing, laddie. This is a private conversation I want to have without the others hearing, Dungeon Master. That won't be a problem. We'll step into my chambers for a moment. As each of you have solo moments, you will accompany me to my chambers so that the others are not aware of what takes place. This is to ensure there is no metagaming. Before he walks off, I'd like to call to him and ask, where's your blacksmiths? He turns to you and points at something over your shoulder. You can see a small set of stables attached to a structure with a burning furnace. Now your attention is on there. You can hear the clinking sounds of metal banging metal and can see a figure hitting something with a hammer. Are they likely to part with their weapons at a low price? You can ask, but they're very proud of their art, as they like to call it. Just how low were you thinking? Well, for free, at least until I can earn some funds from the governor. Unless you're a master at persuasion. That stubborn goat won't part for anything for nothing, but good luck to you. And he walks away with Swolnald. Now, if you'll accompany me, Donald, you will have the first solo moment. Nice place. It's where I go to prepare for each session. Yeah, perfect. So I'm alone with Escobar, right? Indeed. Ask what you need, Donald. The others will not hear this. I look around for a moment to make sure we're not being overheard before leaning in and speaking to the dwarf. You wanted to question one of these cult members, correct? Escobar looks at you, a little confused. Aye, that's correct. You could have asked me that in front of the others, though. My methods are not desirable, and best to not be spoken out loud. I will bring you a cult member to do with as you wish, but I want something in return. His confusion now turns to a more stern look. What do you want? More gold? I can get gold easy enough. No, what I want is information, and the one who holds it is hiding in your temple. I'll bring you a cultist. You bring me your priest. Escobar now looks taken aback. Our priest? Why? That is my business. Do you agree to my terms? Before he can answer, there is a colossal explosive sound that erupts into the night air. You both look towards the source of the noise and see people running towards it. I must see what that's about. And he runs at a sprint. That will conclude your solo moment. Joe, now it is your turn. Okay, I walk towards the figure. See you shortly, I say to the others. So Gurmley will head towards the blacksmith and Bama will wait by the gate. Sharpen, you wanted to be healed by the clerics, correct? That's right, then on to Terry Winkles. Very well, you leave to be healed by the clerics. We'll come back to you after Gormley has been to the blacksmiths. Please come with me to my chambers for your solo moment. Joe, as you approach, you can see a tall Aarakocra with silver feathers. They are striking a sword with such force the sounds reverberate through your body. Sparks fly in every direction with each passing strike. 
After a particularly loud bang, they pause for a moment, examining the blade. Can I tell what type of sword they're making? Roll me an intelligence check. As I'm proficient with simple and martial weapons, can I roll with advantage? Sure, go ahead. Even with your proficiency in weapons, you are unable to tell what type of sword they are making. Could you not let Trump know how bad I did on intelligence? What happens in these solo moments is only revealed should your character allow it, or if they have significant effect on the story. I will say nothing on this matter. Thanks, Dungeon Master. I think his hate boner for me would probably rip a hole through the ceiling. I'm gonna act like I know anyways. That's some fine craftsmanship you have there. The Aarakocra doesn't look up but continues examining the blade. Utter nonsense! The metal does not mold how it should. It is wretched! And he continues banging away. I meant it looks to be on its way to becoming a fine piece of craftsmanship. Once it is complete, of course, you have a good eye for it, I see. It is not right. He speaks a word with every blow. He eventually stops and drops it in a large container of water and disappears behind a veil of steam, showing only a silhouette. After a moment it clears, he wipes his beak with a cloth and looks at you for the first time, but only briefly before turning and moving towards the furnace. What is it you want? All my weapons have gone to the soldiers of Greenest. I was hoping as a fellow enthusiast of fine weapons that perhaps you would have something a little more special. Maybe something held on to that didn't go out to the soldiers. Something that not just anyone could wield. Something perhaps more worthy of a fighter of justice. He stares at you, then retreats into the back. A moment later, he walks out with an impressive looking sword, long and somewhat intimidating, with a fine black leather bound hilt. The moonlight shines brightly off of it. You notice it seems larger than even your long sword. This is Night Striker. It is a great sword that holds magical properties. You notice his eyes gleam as he stares almost lovingly at it. One of my finest works of art yet. I can see. It truly is a work of art. May I ask what magical properties does it hold? Do you see the markings along the blade? It has been blessed by a shaman from my home village. When you have attuned to this weapon, you can speak with all members of Corvids and in turn understand what they say back. Ah yes, the noble Corvids. Would you, Sir Blacksmith of Greenest, bestow upon me the honor of wielding this magnificent sword so I may seek justice for the people of this fine town? You wish to purchase Night Striker? His eyes widen and he brings the sword close to his chest. It is of high price, of which I'd say you could not afford. Can you really put a price on such fine art? I say with a sincere smile. Surely such a masterpiece deserves to be showcased to the world, and what finer way than to be wielded by such a fighter as I? In my hands, this sword would bring justice against any that seek to cause evil and suffering. Roll me a persuasion check. High number's good, right? You have convinced me, sir. It should indeed be wielded by one such as yourself. Woohoo! For only 300 gold. But my good sir, I do not have 300 gold. Perhaps you could give it to me on good faith that I shall return with that amount at a later date. He looks at you as if you had just slapped him across the face. I'm sorry, I simply cannot part with it without a fair price. He sheathes the great sword and starts walking into the back with it. Perhaps I could do a, a task for you to earn the price. We're leaving soon to protect the mill, and maybe there's something I can do while outside the keep. He stops walking. The mill, you say? He turns around and hastens his steps towards you. You're going to the mill? Yes, myself and three others will be departing in a few minutes. Then there is something you can do for me. Accomplish this task and I shall part with this sword. Inside the mill is where my pet cat, Sir Fluffsalot, loves to spend his days. I haven't seen him since the raid started. I'm certain that's where he would be, but I've not been able to get there to retrieve him. He is a pure white tabby. If you can bring him to me, the sword is yours. You have yourself a deal. By the way, do you have any torches I may use? Those tunnels are quite dark, you see. Yes, I have some you can use. And he returns with four torches. Also take this, and he hands you a small gold bell. If Sir Fluffsalot does not come to you, ring this. It's his dinner bell. I will find Sir Fluffsalot and bring him to you in one piece. I put my hand out to shake his. 
He takes your hand and you feel a particularly strong grip. The sword and I will be waiting. The sudden sound of an explosion erupts behind you. I want to run towards it. Very well, but for now that ends our solo moment. Barack, it's your turn. This way, please. You are standing by the gate, quietly watching as your three other party members walk away. You have a moment to yourself to contemplate the events that have occurred so far, from arriving at the town to the battle that took place nearly straight after. The words that have been spoken by the cult members, the loss of one of the town's folk, the half-dragon that did not take its eyes off of you and sharpen, and the dragon you encountered. With all these events that transpired, I would like for you to roll a constitution check for me. Very good. Although the events could be considered traumatic, your nerves do not falter. Instead, you find yourself falling asleep as you have taken a seat on the floor, leaning against the stone wall. It is the fifth night. Your dreams begin as they have done every fifth night for the last month. The world has been destroyed. A sequence of disasters flash in front of you. Freezing wind bringing icy destruction to forests, chalking fumes that engulf cities, lightning storms that level mountains, waves of acid rain that dissolve thousands of innocents, and a raging fire that turns everything into ash. All is dark. Ten eyes open and look at you. You feel them drawing closer and when they're ready to strike you, you awake to the sound of an explosion. What do I see? Are we being attacked? You can see a thin pillar of smoke coming from Terry Winkles and two bodies on the floor just outside it. I get up and run towards them. Very well. But that will conclude the solo moment. Now to Mr. Shapiro with Sharpen in the infirmary. It is your turn for your solo moment. Come with me. You stand before the cleric you met the last time you were in here. She has just finished healing your wounds and you have been restored to full health. Thank you, fellow cleric. I examine my hands and feel my face. I must be going, but before I do, has any other elves been through here? I'm looking for my friend. She has long red hair. The cleric shakes her head. I'm sorry, you're the only elf we've seen in greenest. She pauses for a moment as if questioning herself. May I ask you something? You may indeed. If I can answer your questions, it would be the least I could do after your healing touch. She smiles at you and holds out a small silver chain with a locket on the end. Your friend who was brought in here earlier, the one who was quite angry at your other friend. Would you pass on a message for me, please? My friend. Oh, you must mean Swolnald. I wouldn't call us friends. We hardly know each other, but yes. What is your message? She places the locket and chain into your hand and closes it over. Please let him know the gods will have heard his words of promise to Lillian and they will guide him to her final wish. This was hers. Please give this to him. Yes, of course I will, but what was her wish? Your friend will know. It was in his ear she whispered it before she succumbed to her injuries. I must be going now. And she walks out of the room, leaving you standing there. The locket in your hand. I'd like to examine the locket. Roll me an investigation check. In your attempt to open the locket, you accidentally break it apart. The locket itself remains shut, but the chain has now come off. I'll have to see if I can get Bama to fix it. Okay, I make my way to Terry Winkle's. You make your way to the potion brewers. Inside, you can see Terry Winkle. He appears to be fixated on a particularly large bottle with bright pink liquid. He keeps adding fine dust to it and watches as it reacts. I walk up to him. Hello, Mr. Winkle. I've... Can you roll me a stealth check? I haven't tried to sneak in, though. True, but I would like you to roll one all the same. What in a goblin's butt cheek? He jumps out of his chair and falls onto the ground, dropping a large handful of dust into the pink bottle. You scared the life out of me there. Good job. He clambers back up and dusts himself off. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I was coming here to see if I could get more of those elixir of life potions and maybe some other things. Ah, uh, I see. Well, of course I'd be happy to... He stops in mid-sentence as you both hear a large gurgling sound accompanied by rolling thunder. The large bottle had begun frothing at the top. Terry Winkle grabs your hand and pulls you out the door. Get down! 
The door of the potion brewers explodes and a tremendous rumble echoes throughout the keep. Guards coming running from every direction, swords and spears out. Governor Nighthill is with them. He quickly calls out as you can see Escobar starting to make his way over. It's okay, everyone. Go back to your stations. Really good, sir. I know you like to tinker, but given everything that is going on right now, could you please have some consideration to what's happening? And he walks away. The gnome gets back up and helps lift you to your feet. Well, needless to say, I don't have potions, or anything for that matter for you, dear boy. Best to be on your horse, as they say. And he starts wading through mounds of strange-looking remnants of oddly colored and textured material that had oozed out of the door. That felt a little forced, Dungeon Master. Perhaps. But you did roll unnaturally high on your stealth. That concludes the solo moment. Sharpen is standing outside the now destroyed potion brewers when both Gurmly and Bama come running towards you from either direction, shortly followed by Escobar and finally Swolnald. Are you okay? What happened? Terry Winkle added a bit too much to a potion and it kind of backfired. But I'm fine. Doesn't look like we're getting any more potions though. Did you get torches? Yeah, I got four and I hand out two to Swole. My mere presence lights any area, but I still take them. Now, as I was rudely interrupted and everything here seems fine, can we go and finish our conversation, Escobert? He looks sideways at you for a moment, strokes his beard, and then says, No need. I will agree to your terms. Now let us get on with this. Come with me so I may finish with the gate and start cleaning this mess up. His eyes fall on the mound of congealed ooze which has stopped oozing out the doorway, but bubbles now and then, giving off the smell of rotten eggs. What terms are you speaking of? I say as we walk towards the gate. Keep your nose out of others' business, young lady. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize. Please forgive my utter rudeness, miss. And Escobar bows deeply to Sharpen. Come on, not you two, Dungeon Master? Oh my God, if I had the capability of laughter, I don't think I could stop. Sorry, Ben. Anyways, Escobar opens the gate and the four of you walk into the tunnels. As the gate shuts behind you, Escobar calls out to Swolnald. So long as no harm comes to him, mind you. And he walks away. It is completely pitch black inside the tunnel, with the only source of light coming from the torches of the keep. Oh shit, we forgot to light the torches. It's okay, Gurmly, here, look. And I cast Firebolt at the one in Gurmly's hand. Do I need to roll for this? No, I'll say it was successful, and Gurmly's torches erupts into bright flames. Here, Swole, hold yours out and light it with mine. I'll go along with this, then I will stride out in front. Who's got the directions? I do, and I pull out the parchment. These tunnels will have nothing eventful happening, so for now. Allow this time for your characters to talk among themselves while you follow the directions. I will let you know when you have reached the end. Bama, could you use mending on this? I hold out the locket and show it to him. That is indeed something I could do. I don't think I have seen this before on you. You wouldn't have. I was given it to pass to Swolnald, but it broke. I think it's rather delicate. You were given what? To give to me, I say, without turning around. One of the clerics in the infirmary handed it to me. It belonged to Lillian. I stopped walking and turned to face Sharpen. I would have an extremely serious look on my face that only enhanced my good looks. You have something of Lillian's for me, and you broke it? Not, not intentionally, I swear, but it's okay. Bama can fix it, right? I nod to them both. Taking the locket and chain in my hands, I hold them close to my face and whisper into my hands. They glow for a moment. I part my hands to reveal a now fixed locket and chain. There is no need for you to worry. I have fixed it in a hurry. This is quite a beautiful locket. Perhaps keep it in your pocket. I take the locket from Bama and for a brief moment look at the gnome. Thanks. And I continue walking on, turning it over in my palm with my thumb. Swole, the cleric had a message for you as well. Shit. What's wrong? I forgot to get the Aarakocra's name. Hmm, he kind of looked like a Steve. Okay, I look at Sharpen. What did she say? That the gods have heard your words and they will guide you to her final wish. <laughs> gods, foolish girl, I don't need gods for this. What are you talking about? For what? Has this got something to do with Escobar? Last chance, Elf. Stop asking me. I know Lillian's death was hard on you, but if you're going to attempt something that could cause problems, don't you think it would be wiser to keep the rest of us informed? Okay, that's it. I tower over the elf with twitching muscles. What I do is my business, got it? I never wanted a group, I never needed one. 
All I have got so far is interference, and now someone's death on my hands. Fuck you and you, and especially you. I continue to walk on. You notice your voice echoed slightly differently this time, and you feel a slight breeze. About 30 feet from you, you can make out a gate, slightly lit from moonlight, with what look like crates in front of it. You've reached the end of the tunnel. At fucking last, I step on my torch. Whiteface, put your torch out. Whoever has the key, go get it open. And I draw my axe. I put out my torch and draw my longsword. I run forward and open the gate. What can I see? Other than the crates which have been piled in front of the gate. Not a whole lot. There is a tree roughly 10 feet from you, and it looks like nothing else but fields. You seem to be on the edge of the town. We'll need to move these crates, quietly, before we can go anywhere. According to Escobert's map, we should be. Here, we're not too far from the mill. I can move these crates. Same here. Both of you give me strength checks. You have no problem moving the crates without causing any sounds. As you venture outside, you can't hear any more screaming, but you do hear some commotion from outside one of the houses nearby. Are the preparations complete? Yes, Mondeth. How many lie in wait? Fifteen, Mondeth. That may not be enough. They took 12 out outside the keep, according to Tyenrath. Double it. Are you sure, Mondeth? What about... You dare question me? No, no, not at all. It shall be done at once. Yes, it will, but you will not handle it. Your lack in faith in me greatly displeases the cult. You hear a sharp grunt and the sound of something hitting the floor. It sickens me to see it withering. You two, take it away from my sight. I must go tend to other business. You, go inform the kobolds to double their number. We have yet to hear they have left the keep yet, but they may already have found a way over there. I want preparations to be ready. Tell them I will be sending more members to assist. Kobolds are disgusting wretches, but they do make good fodder. You hear some shuffling. The distant steps of someone running, another walking, and then you see two hooded figures carrying a third, of which is moaning slightly. Hurry up, let's just dump him over here. No. Mondath wouldn't want him in anyone's sight. Let's put him, ah, over there by the crates. And they start shuffling towards the very spot the four of you are standing. Looks like we have some luck coming our way. I ready an action to strike should they see us. Same here. We do this quietly, guys, quick and easy. Too much noise may draw attention. Time for some stealth attacks. The four of you stand in the semi-darkness of the tunnel entrance, readying yourselves for a fight as you watch two men in black robes carrying a third. They drag his lifeless corpse toward the very spot you stand. Now, Swolnald and Gurmley have prepared a reaction to attack should the cloaked men spot you. What about the rest of the party? I ready a cantrip of shocking grasp if they would spot us. I'll ready firebolt. If they see us, I'll cast it at the one furthest away. Then I'll target the one closest to us. I'll go for the same one as sharpen. I reckon if we each double up on one, we've got a good chance of taking them straight out. Then I'll go for the one closest. But I want to do non-lethal damage, so not to outright kill him. What? Did I hear that right? Who are you and what have you done with Donald? I'm still the lovable scamp you all know and respect. Strong assumptions. But I have a task to do that requires bringing one of these bastards back with us, Obama. Can you help me out and also go for non-lethal damage? Why do you need to bring back a cultist? I've got my reasons. What do you say, Barack? Well, my character would have no reason to not do lethal damage. You're going to need to explain as swole in order to get assistance here. Fine, I say quietly to the others. Listen, guys, I need to take one of these cultists alive. I'll explain after, but I need you to not kill him. You ask much from us and give little in return, but help you I shall, for your trust I wish to earn. Good to hear. I would like you all to make stealth checks. Oh, fuck. Both Swole, Nald, and Sharpen fail their stealth checks. Sharpen's heavy armor rattles as he shifts on the spot, and Swole's massive size could not be concealed in full by the darkness. One of the cultists looks up at the sound of the armor and sees Swole, Nald. What the fuck? It's them! I attack with my longsword. I cast Firebolt! I rush forward and hit the closest with the blunt side of my axe. I too rush forward and cast Shocking Grasp. As the one who saw Swole did not see Sharpen or Gurmley. Both Ben and Joe can roll with advantage on their attacks. The one with his back to you was alerted and turns as you attack. Normal rolls from Barack and Donald. 
with the combined power of Sharpen's firebolt and Gurmley's attack. The cultist furthest away is killed, having fire burn his face and Gurmley slicing his throat. He falls quickly. The one closest took enough damage to kill him, but as you've stated, you were going for non-lethal damage. The shocking grasp electrocutes him on the spot, causing him to become rigid with shock. Swole hits him on the back of the head, knocking him out cold. Little noise is caused, and you hear no commotion from the direction of the ones you heard earlier. All is quiet. I don't think we were overheard. Let's go, boys. Swole, why do you need one of these cultists alive? I'll explain in a minute. I bend down and lift the unconscious cultist and carry him into the tunnel. Does anyone have any rope? Donald, if you looked at your character sheet, you would see you have rope, as does Joe's and Ben's. Oh, snap. Never mind. I have some on me. I begin to tie up the cultist after I remove his robes first. We should bring the other two in as well. I grab the legs of the one that was initially carried over. Bama, can you help me? I nod at Sharpen and also grab the cultist's legs. The two of you drag the cultist into the tunnel. Suddenly you hear a moan coming from him and realize he is not dead. Did you hear that? He's still alive. Not for long. I raise my axe ready to strike. Hold fast. Stay where you are, Stomp. Hear me out before you whump. An opportunity has arisen that could prove beneficial indeed. We could get information freely given from this newly defeated fiend. We keep him alive and get our questions answered, instead of you taking this chance to be a bastard. If we could just get through this without another fight, it would be the greatest moment of this whole night. But should he prove to be of no worth, you may show him your almighty girth. With your ax out at arm's length, you may flex upon him your great strength, but please give us this chance of opportunity to seek the knowledge that may help you and me. I stare at Bama for a moment, then I lower my ax. Very well, Gnome. Ask what you want, but if he yells, I strike. I'll bring the third cultist into the tunnels while this is going on and remove his robe. I kneel down next to the cultist and place a hand on his shoulder. Can you sit up? The man grunts a little and attempts to slide himself up against the tunnel wall. He is hunched somewhat with his hand over his stomach. Even in the darkness, you can see the dampness of his robes where fresh blood begins pooling. Thanks to the odd ray of moonlight piercing the clouds above and shedding dim light over him. With his hood up, his face is mostly hidden, but you can tell by the pale skin that shows that he has a young face, possibly late teens, maybe a little older. With black hair protruding slightly from under his hood, he raises his head so it is level with yours. I'm going to ask you some questions and you are going to answer them. If you do not, or you attempt to call for help, my friend here is going to split your skull in half. Do you understand? Roll me an intimidation check, Ben. Can I help with this? I think that would be acceptable, yes. God damn it, Shapiro. Biden's loose sphincter would have been more intimidating. Actually, Donald, you notice the cultist shake a little. What, what do you want to know? For starters, how many of you are here in Greenest? More than a thousand. I'd like to check to see if he is lying. Go ahead. For someone with the word wise in their name, you sure do suck at wisdom checks. Can we all check? I'll allow one more to have a try. I have a plus three to insight. Hey, same here. Do you want to do it? You're actually letting sleepy fucking Joe make a wisdom based check? Oh yeah, baby, suck it, Trump. With your high insight, you can tell the cultist is lying. I walk forward, tossing the robes aside, and I slap the cultist across the face. We have not got time for your lies. The next words out of your mouth better be the truth. I nod approvingly to White Nose. The cultist had fallen to his side at the force of the slap. He gets himself back into position, breathing heavily. Okay, okay, I don't know exactly, but I think around 100, mostly kobolds. What were you planning just now? We got word that a small group of travelers had arrived in the town and had fought and won against our southern raiders. They also took out a larger group in front of the central stronghold. They're waiting for you at the mill. He begins to chuckle to himself. I pull down his hood and grab his hair, pulling back his head and raising my ax to his neck. What's so funny? A twisted smile forms over the face of the young man as his eyes lock onto Swole's. You're all going to die tonight, either by my brothers or our masters. 
I push my axe against his neck. Oh yeah? Who are your masters? The one that gut you and left you to rot? He continues to stare at you, unblinkingly and with that twisted smile. I lean forward. I've heard two names mentioned this night, Mondath and Sienrath. Tell me about them. His eyes flicker at the mention of those names and he looks at Sharpen instead. Mondath is our leader. Mondath is wise and powerful. He looks back at Swole. Mondath was right to punish me. Mondath should never be questioned. And what about the other one, Cyanrath? Are they also a leader? His eyes dart from Sharpen to Gurmley and back again. An ally to our cause, cunning and clever. He has been watching your movements with great interest. He will help us achieve our goals and you will all burn to ash. He holds his hand out and shows his five fingers. You will all die and she will rise. Who are you talking about? The Dragon Queen, Tiamat. He begins laughing. And before any of you have time to react, he moves his head against the blade of the ax, slicing his own neck. Blood sprays across Sharpen's face as the cultists continue smiling and falls limp. I wipe the blood off my face and stand up. If they're waiting for us at the mill, it sounds like a trap. What do you guys want to do? Regardless if it is a trap, if they're people to save, we go save them. We have some robes so we can continue on with our plan. They don't know about that part. I got what I was after, but I agree with white privilege. Let's go kick these fuckers' asses. I hope I get to run into this Cyan Wrath. Going to make him more of a bitch than the elf here. People need our help this night. I'd rather do this without a fight. But should we have no other option, then fuck them up and to the wind with caution. Okay then, but we have a problem. We only have three sets of robes between us. I've got an idea for that, I say with a bit of a smile. I take the robes off of the one who just died and throw them to Bama. Me, the gnome and white power, will each pose as cultists. We'll tie you up as our female prisoner. And when they realize I'm not female? We'll surprise attack them. I think having one of us as a prisoner could work. Let's do it. Yay, more waifu moments. You all suck. Fuck it, fine. I'll go along with this, but I swear. If at any point you try to pimp me out, I will fire blast the lot of you. So with it agreed, Swole, Bama, and Gurmley each put on a set of robes, Bama's being a little too big for him and Swole's being too small, you set off. Do you know which direction you are going? I believe I do. It should be this section here on the map. The one at the top? That's right. Why do you think this is the correct place? Looking at the map, it's walled off and there's a windmill. Seems like the right place for it. I can see your logic, Ben, but that's not the mill. It's actually down here. You'll need to walk through the town to get there. Or you can use the tunnels again and take a slightly different path. Fuck the tunnels. We've got robes and a prisoner. Let's just walk through the town. I will make sure my real prisoner is tied up good and tight first and well hidden. I'll need to come back for him later. I actually agree with Donald. Now that we're clothed like cultists, we may as well play the part. Very well. The four of you walk on through the town. Many of the houses lay in ruin. Some still smolder from earlier fire attacks. It is oddly quiet. Most likely the area has already been cleaned out. Your journey towards the mill passes uneventful until you pass the last set of houses before the river crossing. You can see three kobolds huddled together. They appear to be bickering over something and do not notice you until you are very close. What you doing sneaking up on us? Guys, I should probably not talk. Might give us away if I'm rhyming. Good point. Leave this to me and the Bidenator. I step forward and place my hand out with palm open. The kobold looks at you, slightly confused. You're not part of them group. Watch you shooing me your hand fur. I retract my hand quickly, just reminding you of who we are. We knows who you are. Use them dragoon men what's got us taken all to gold. Watch who want them. We're taking a prisoner to the mill. And I shove sharpen. Mondath wants a piece of ass to keep her warm, you know. The kobold snicker and I up sharpen. Ugly looking thing this is. Indeed she is, but the boss wants what the boss wants. Is there a bridge we can use to get across the river? Of course there is. Fixed it, didn't we? Good, then we'll leave you to your business. The kobolds look at each other, then slowly back at you. Don't you want the gold? Of course we do. Brother White Balls, how careless of you to forget. Give it to me. And I hold out my hand. One of the kobolds pulls out a sack and starts walking forward, but another puts his arm out in front stopping the first from moving any closer. Something ain't right about this. Who seem different from the others? I step forward, shoving Sharpen again. It's been a long night and we don't have time to be keeping Mondath waiting. 
hand over our gold and step aside or she'll hear about this. Roll me a deception check. Shit. The one out front draws his blade. D's ain't cultists. Everyone, roll for initiative. Using my longsword, I run at the one on the right and attempt to stab it through the chest. Your attack is successful. It falls down with one hit. Take them down. Let's make this quick. I run forward and cut the one on the left's head, clean off its shoulders. Another direct hit. This one also goes down with a single blow. All right, you two. Previous fights suggest you'll both fuck it up. Prove to us you haven't picked the worst classes for this campaign. I cast Firebolt. Holy shit, he actually hit it. Unfortunately, it was not enough to kill it, although one more attack will do the trick. Finish it, Bama. I too will cast Firebolt. That makes for four consecutive successes. Between the two of you, you managed to take down the last of the kobolds. That will conclude combat. We should get moving. We don't want to draw any more attention. You make your way across the river's now fixed bridge and along the bank until you reach the mill. You cannot see anyone posted at the entrance, or anywhere for that matter. It looks deserted. It doesn't seem like anything is going on here, but we should be on our guard. Is everyone ready? I nod towards Gurmley, gripping my axe tightly. I take a deep breath and ready myself. I would like to take another elixir of time potion to fully restore my magic and possibly get rid of this rhyming curse. Very well, Barak. I shall pass you a note as to what effects the next one has. As you drink from the vial, a strange light forms itself around you, and for the briefest of moments, you vanish in pure white light. Bama? Standing before you all where Bama the Wise stood moments ago is a creature of similar size and wearing almost the exact same attire, the black robes having fallen away the once dark skin of the gnome replaced with black feathers and where two arms once were, now sit a pair of arm-like wings. The blue and green eyes replaced with jet black and where there was once a mouth, now sits a yellow bill. Are you saying what I think you're saying? I believe so. Bama the Wise has turned into a gnome-sized duck. Can you still speak? According to my note, I can only quack as I do not have the capability of English. That's fine, it'll just be like talking to Biden. Hmm? What's going on? Don't worry about it. I look at the new form that is the duck gnome, then to the others. So now he's a duck. At least he'll stop rhyming. Might be even less inconspicuous this way. This just got a whole lot worse. We should probably start making our way in, but before we do, can we see anyone around? Make a perception check. You do not see anyone in view. You do, however, hear a soft meow coming from the side of the mill. Sir Fluffs a lot. What? Uh, can I see him? There is no sign of the cat at this point. Darn, oh wait, I have the bell. Joe, what are you talking about? I reach into my cloak and pull out a small bell. Do you think you should maybe let us know what you're doing before you do it? We're right on the edge of a potential trap here. Now nah, it'll be fine. I have a side quest to save the blacksmith's cat. He gave me this bell to call it. I don't think that's a wise idea, but this is you I'm talking to, so it's totally on brand. But given what's just happened to our gnome, Probably not a great idea to be calling a cat over right now. I ring the bell. Nice knowing your character, Barack. The sound of the bell jingles into the quiet night air. A moment later, you spot a pure white tabby emerge from the shadows. It moves along the ground without making a sound. Then it stops dead in its tracks, its eyes reflecting the moonlight as it stares unblinkingly at Bama. Oh, shit. Roll me a constitution saving throw, with disadvantage due to you being a duck. The sight of the cat ahead of you fills you with fear. You want nothing more than to get away from it as it begins to crouch low in an attempt to not be seen by you and recognize the action of one that is preparing to pounce. I begin backing up. Unable to speak in English, I simply say, quack. Can I fly as a duck? You have 30 feet of flying speed, in addition to your walking speed. I take flight and head for the top of the mill. 
The cat leaps into the air as you pass but misses you. It begins chasing after you and starts climbing up the side of the mill. We have to stop him. I'm on it. I cast fireball at the cat. Don't hurt Sir Fluffs a lot. Your fireball misses the tabby by a couple of inches and makes contact with the edge of the building, blasting a small piece away. The cat runs into the darkness, hissing slightly. Thank goodness. The noise of the fireball causes a commotion within the building and out pour several kobolds and a couple of hooded figures, one of which spots Swolnald, Gurmly, and Sharpen standing at the entrance. They hurry over to you. What's going on here? I raise a hand in welcome. Greetings, my brothers. We were escorting a prisoner and she attempted to cast some offensive magic, but fear not as I am mighty and stopped it from causing much damage. I slap Sharpen around the back of the head. Bitch needs to know her place, you know what I mean? Watch it, Donald. Play along, Ben, don't be a pussy. Donald, roll me a deception check. Fuck yeah, let's go. The kobolds have no reason not to believe you and begin walking back towards the mill. The two cultists continue to stand there for a moment. Why did you bring her here? All prisoners were to be taken to Kianrath. We couldn't find him and we're nearby. We thought this would be a good place to hold her for now while we regrouped. Roll me another deception check. Chinrath is currently in one of the houses near the main stronghold. He is watching the actions of a group that's been getting in our way this night. You can stay here for now, but keep her from causing any more trouble. We can tie her up against that well over there. She won't be causing you any trouble. Excellent, then you can help us with preparations. Preparations for what? We've been having some trouble with a group that arrived into town and took out several of our kobold allies. Mondath believes they will be heading here, no doubt to protect this mill from being burnt down. We need help in setting up vantage points to... Hold on, how do we know that these three aren't that group? I put my hand out, showing all my fingers. Do not question our resolve, brothers. Tiamat will rise and bring down fire and brimstone upon the non-followers, reigning in a new age of darkness. That was some quick thinking, Joe. If I wasn't sitting here seeing and hearing it for myself, I would never have believed that was possible. Roll me a deception check. Oh, did that work? The two cultists bow their heads. Our apologies, brothers, for our doubt. Please enter and tie your prisoner. They step aside to allow you entry. The mill is not overly large. It comprises of a single floor with large barn-like doors at the front. You can see several barrels and crates stacked on the side, a well in the center of the open area outside the building, and a stone wall some 10 feet high surrounding the vicinity. Can we tell what's inside the barrels? Unless you were to inspect them closely, all you can really obtain is a strong odor coming from them. Of what, though, you are unsure. But it is not pleasant. I say quietly to the others as we walk towards the well, something is off in those barrels. One of you should check them out. I could do that seeing as I'm just sitting on my ass at the moment. I take it no one has spotted me yet? At the moment, no. However, if you're planning on moving to get closer to those barrels, I would like a stealth check. You got it. Ah, oh, nice. Okay, so I carefully make my way along the roof of the mill and fly down to the barrels. What can I tell? You can smell that strong odor and notice a leak coming from one of them. A thick liquid slowly drips, amber-colored, onto the ground. Give me a history check. Your vast historical knowledge tells you this is dragon oil, a highly flammable and explosive substance that in small quantities can be used to soak torches in. On a larger scale, it could be used to level a small town. Holy shit. We could use that to our advantage. I'm sorry, gentlemen, but you, where you stand, have no knowledge of what is in the barrels, and unless you have already forgotten, Bama is incapable of human speech right now, so cannot tell you about this. And even if he could, he is currently hiding out of sight from the cultists and kobolds. Okay. Well, I don't necessarily need to tell them about it, do I? I could just set them off myself with a fireball. You could do that, sure. However, if you are too close to these barrels and you use fireball on them, the explosion would cause catastrophic damage to yourself. You would need to roll an exceptionally high dexterity saving throw in order to escape the blast. If you fail this, it will mean the end for you. What if I were flying, say, 30 feet in the air? It would reduce the required number you'd need for a success. Not a bad idea, Barack. 
I'm glad to see you're using this change to your advantage. Now roll me a dexterity saving throw. I don't mean to do it now. It's not for that. The cat is back and about to pounce on you. Oh no, Bama's about to be kitty. Fuck that. There, tell me I got away. You narrowly avoided the cat from attacking you, flying back up to the roof of the mill. It prowls on the ground, meowing loudly, getting the attention of one of the kobolds that's walking past. It cackles and runs at the cat, brandishing a dagger, but the cat flees back into the dark. The kobold looks disappointed and continues on. For now, then, I'll remain still. While this has been happening, we've been tying up Sharpen. I'm going to leave it loose, though, so he can escape easily if shit goes down. I lean into him and say, concentrate on keeping me and white shit from dying and we'll take care of the rest, okay? I give him a nod to show I understand. Come on, let's scope this place out and get an idea of how many of these fucktards are here. I guess we, we could walk over to those barrels to also know what's inside them. You do that while I go inside the mill. I'll find out just how many are in there and then we can meet back here to check on our prisoner. Very well. While Gurmley is checking the barrels, you, Swole Nald, enter the mill. It is mostly empty except for a few more crates, some stacks of what appear to be food supplies, and a mechanical structure that is used for the large wheel outside. There are nine kobolds inside and the two cultists you saw at the entrance, one of which walks up to you, showing his hand. Welcome, brother. You're just in time for the briefing. Come join us. And he gestures you towards the group. The other cultist addresses you all. Brothers of the cult and our kobold allies, tonight has been long and fruitful. We are a step closer towards our goal. The crowd cheers at these words. The cultist raises a hand for silence. But now is not the time for celebration, for we are gathered here for one final mission before we are to depart back to camp. There is a group that will be making their way to this mill. It is our job to eradicate them all. They are the ones who shed your kin's blood and they would do the same to you as well. The kobolds begin hissing in hatred. You see several of them raise their daggers in the air. Glorious Mondath is on her way with more allies to strengthen our numbers. We will not have long to wait, but for now we must remain within these walls. He looks at you, Swolnald. Two brothers have already joined us and they bring with them a hostage of the town. More cheers from the group and a kobold gives you a slap on the back. She is tied up by the well, a perfect piece of bait to lure these foes into a trap. Once we have finished with them, you may have your way with her. A huge eruption of cackles and jeers follow this, and the cultist raises his hand, showing all five fingers for the Dragon Queen. Oh, who? Sharpen is so fucked if this doesn't work out. Can you stop smiling? It's creeping me out. Have I been able to check the barrels? Yes, and I'll say that you have worked out what's inside them, so you have made your way back to the well to let Sharpen know. Donald, what are you doing now? I'm going to head back outside to let the others know what's happening. The cultist who greeted you calls out to you. Brother, where are you going? We need to stay inside and be ready. I am going to make sure our prisoner is secured to the well and get our other brother in here. I will be back in a moment. Roll me a deception check. Man, I am just the greatest with these rolls tonight. Seriously, no one rolls better than me. I take it I trick this punk ass bitch easy? Indeed you do. He nods to you and returns to the group. Bitching. I head back out to the others and tell them what I heard. You see my character's face go extremely pale. We must make sure we defeat them guys. I don't know what to think what'll be done to me if we lose. Don't worry, we won't lose. White Guild, did you find out what's in those barrels? Dragon oil. Now, it's really dangerous stuff to have, you know, in uh, such high quantities. Uh, they might be planning on using it to blow up the keep, but if we were able to keep this lot inside the mill, we could take them all out in a single hit. I like your thinking. Let's wait until this other group arrives and find a way of getting as many of them inside the mill. Then Sharpen could cast Fireball and then boom, mission accomplished. So let me get this straight. We came here to protect the mill and your plan is to destroy it. Are you fucking retarded? Don't get cute with me, Elf. The plan has changed. We have this cult leader and a shitload of enemies coming this way, even as great as I am. There's no way we can defeat this many enemies on our own. Plus all this shit about Tiamat is giving me chills and not the kind that make my nipples ache. If we can take out all these assholes, then when it's over, we can help rebuild the mill, okay? 
And what about Bama? He's on that roof at the moment. He could get caught in the explosion. He checked out the barrels before we did. He probably knows what's in them and will have worked out we would be looking to set them off. Plus he can fly now, so fuck him. He'll be fine. The Keep will be sending guards over to help us remember. Maybe we should just try to take on as many as we can for as long as we can first. If it gets out of hand, then sure, we blow it up. But as a last resort, before any of you can say another word, you hear the sounds of many footsteps and see another large group arrive. Fifteen kobolds, two more hooded figures, and someone in purple robes leading out front walk into the area. She appears to be talking to herself. Damn that Cheyenne Wrath. Trying to tell me I can't have his personal guard? I say what everyone does. If he wants to keep hostages, then he can do it off his own back. I have far more important uses for our allies than he does. I don't know why he doesn't just kill them and be done with it. She stops about 30 feet from you and looks around. You two, where are your comrades? I walk forward and show my hand. Good evening, Mondath. They await your arrival inside the mill. I know where they are, you deranged simpleton. My orders were very clear for you all to wait for me inside. What the hell do you think you're doing disobeying me? We were securing a prisoner we captured on our way to here and to keep an eye out for this group that is coming. Roll me a deception check. Shit. One of the kobolds in the group makes a strange noise, a bit like <gasps> a gasp. It's them Mondeth. They are the ones who took out my group into South. So much for the plan. God damn it, Bidenator. I rip off my black robes, flexing my massive and majestic muscles, nipples pulsing. You want a piece of the stomp? I too rip off my robes and draw my longsword. We won't let you get away with the pain you have caused this night. Prepare to taste my steel. I pull myself out of the rope ties and raise both hands, preparing to cast magic. You made a crucial error in thinking you could take us on. Quack! I stand up on the roof, both hands raised like sharpened. Well, wings, but you get the idea. For fuck's sake, you just gave away your position. Kobold, kill them all! Roll for initiative! Mondeth takes a sidestep and calls to the others. These insects will fall tonight. You, fetch me the others within the mill. You two, climb the walls and take out that creature on the rooftop. Make this quick. It's your turn, Ben. Is there a way we can get onto that rooftop? It could be easier for us having the height advantage. The water trough could give you a potential leg up to reach the edge of the roof and pull yourself up. You'd need a good strength check to pull it off. I'm going to do that then. Here we go. Your strength is not your greatest trait. However, the fear of being overrun by this many kobolds gives you enough adrenaline to successfully jump from the trough to the edge of the roof, and you manage to pull yourself up. Ah, uh, I'm gonna use my remaining spell slot to cast Bless on Bama, Gormley, and Swole, giving them an additional D4 to add to their attack rolls or saving throws. I call to them all. I have blessed you all with extra power. May it help you in the darkest of moments. Now go and kick the shit out of those kobolds. We may have finally had something useful from your character, but so much for the healing. I uh, got you covered, Don, bro. I have a couple of potions of healing. I'll pass you one on my turn. Speaking of which. Oh, yeah? Okay, so I hand a potion over to Swole. Use it wisely. And I, I take a run and attempt to climb on the roof. Give me a strength check. Your years as a fighter has done well to enhance your strength, making it easy for you to scale the building and you find yourself on top of the roof. Get up here, Swole. One of the cultists runs directly into the mill. You have until the next round before the rest of the enemies come out. The other one pulls out a scimitar from within its robes and charges straight at Swolnald. Bring it on. He waves his scimitar wildly, but you're able to dodge the attack. Your turn, Donald. I'm about to Kyle Rittenhouse these bitches. <laughs> I totally rage the fuck out. Can I go for a swing with my great axe? Don't forget your bless. In this case, it's not needed. Your axe makes contact. And in one swing, you cleave the cultist in half. Fuck yeah, that's one for the swole. I take two steps back, so only one of them will reach me. This will make sure I keep the rage train chugging along, but also make sure I don't get overwhelmed by their numbers. As for climbing that wall to get on the roof, that's a weakling's and a coward's way of doing things. I'll leave that to you three. The two kobolds closest to the mill begin making their way over one of which gets as far as the crates. The rest all head for Swole, and only one of them is close enough to reach you with its dagger. 
It deals five piercing damage after being reduced by half due to your rage ability. I wave my arms and quack loudly as three magic missiles launch from my body, the highest damage seeking the one closest to Swole, and the other two targeting the next. That's two for the duck. I will position myself so I have plenty of distance from any enemies that manage to get on the roof. They already took three of you down. Are you all so weak you can't handle four people? You're meant to be Chienrath's personal guard. You six, get up on that roof and take out those magic users. The rest of you take down that massive oath now. I'm going to cast Firebolt at the one closest to Swole. Wait, go after the ones behind that one. I need him to keep my rage going. You got it. Does 14 hit? Indeed. Your firebolt soars through the air and right through the kobold's face, leaving a large hole in the center of its head. Nice. I'll end my turn there. It's going to take those ones some time to get up here, so I have no need to move. I'm going to move to the edge of the roof and prepare a reaction of attack for the moment. One of them gets over the edge. The cultist who ran in earlier now emerges from within the mill, along with the other two. They all run at Swole, brandishing their scimitars. All three attack each one missing. Swole's rage, enhancing his intimidation, has made it difficult for the cultists to focus their attacks. Now it's my turn. I take a swing at the one below me. Swole, move back. There'll be too many of them for you to handle. Disengage and pull back. I can take it. I'm the mighty Swole Nald Stomp. I swing at the cultist. Your mighty axe strikes true, and the cultist goes down after having his head cut clean off. I'm ready for whatever comes next. From within the mill, nine kobolds pour out. They see the other three charging at you and join in the attack. Bring it on. Given the limited spacing, only six kobolds are able to reach you. However, they do all have pack tactics, so they all roll with advantage. Ah, uh, I kind of forgot about that little detail. I'm sure it'll be fine. It would seem the dice gods have blessed you this day, for only half of them were able to hit you. That, with your rage ability of reducing damage, means you only took nine in that wave of attack. Told you I'd be fine. Lucky only three of them hit you. Lucky the DM didn't give them ranged weapons. I considered it when putting this together, but I decided to keep it a little more simple to start with. Now the rest of the kobolds that were ordered to attack you three make their attempts at climbing the mill. The two already at the crates try first one of which stumbles and falls into the crate on which it stood on. The other manages to grasp the edge of the roof. I use my reaction to attack it. Your blade cuts its hands off and it falls to the ground, cracking its skull on impact. It lays motionless. The others run forward and only one has enough movement, as well as being successful at climbing, to get onto the roof. It glares at you with its sharp fangs and attempts to stab you. It succeeds and deals three piercing damage. It cackles in triumph. How low is that thatched roof? I'd say about 10 feet above the ground. Why? I'd like to get to the edge of it and cast Thunder Wave at the group surrounding Swolnall. I believe I can reach six of them without hitting it. You think you can pull that off? We'll see, I'll need these six to make constitution saving throws. I raise my wings in the air and the sound of thunder can be heard. Lightning sparks around me and I shout loudly into the night. Quack! A burst of energy blasts from me towards the six. The cultists succeed and only take half damage. The kobolds, however, fail and take the full force of your thunder wave and are fried on the spot. I think that puts me in the lead for most kills tonight. No one likes a show off unless it's me. This is taking too long. If I have to step in, you will all be sorry to still be alive. I don't like the sound of her. We need to cut these numbers down before she gets involved. I cast Firebolt at the Kobold nearest to me. Just like the last, your Firebolt strikes the enemy down in one hit. I'm going to stay where I am for now. Time to strike this Kobold down. You swing with such force it causes the Kobold's body to fly off the edge. Bitching. Now I run back to about halfway between Bam Bam and Sharpen to give them a bit of protection for when these others make it up here. Very well. And so it falls onto the two remaining cultists who both attack Swole Nald with their scimitar. Neither of which are able to land a hit. No one can take down the mighty Swole Nald Stomp. No one. 
Boss man, quick question. How do healing potions work in this campaign? You can use an action to drink them and you'll receive max stats. Or you can use a bonus action and roll, which is 2d4 plus 2. I'll risk it. Bonus action for the healing potion, then a swing at the cultist on the right. You regain seven hit points. Nice. And that fucking 20, boys. Let's go. The cultist didn't stand a chance. You cleaved it in half from the top down. I am unstoppable. We shall see. You now have seven kobolds attacking you with advantage. Let us hope that potion was enough. Astonishingly, only three of them hit you, dealing seven damage. Their scimitars slashing one after another. I am a fucking god. You need to get out of there, Swole. You won't be able to tank much more at this rate. Throw me another potion, Whitebeard, and I'll finish these fuckers off. Could I do that? You could, however, it would require both of you to succeed. You a strength and Donald a dexterity. Let's do it. I throw the last potion of healing at him. Then both of you make your rolls. Gurmley hurls the bottle into the air. It soars in an arc, straight at Swole, who reaches out and only just manages to grab it, very nearly fumbling it in the process. Nice, thanks, Bidenator. You just went up two points in my good books. Sweet, what am I on now? Two. And now the rest of the kobolds are going to attempt to climb to the roof. The one who fell into the crate clambers out of it and manages to climb up, but has used most of its movement to get out of the crate and then to get up on the roof, so it only moves a couple squares towards Gurmley. One more fails so badly that after grabbing the edge, it breaks away in its hand. It falls and breaks its own neck. Three of the kobolds make it up and get pretty close to Gurmley, but the last one rolled a nat 20, so used minimal movement to get up and was able to move right up to the fighter. He slashes at you with a dagger and was not able to hit you due to your impressive agility. Ha! Swole isn't the only one who can dodge an attack. Try dodging several, then we'll talk. I'm going to cast Firebolt at the last remaining cultist. Fuck yes, nat 20, baby. Your Firebolt, much like Sharpens, pierces a hole into the body of the cultist. It collapses on the ground. He reaches out a hand towards Mondath. Please help us, Mondath! She slowly raises a hand and a warm, glowing light begins to emit from her palm. You can hear a sigh of relief coming from the cultist as he says, thank you, glorious leader. Worthless. A stream of flames erupts from her palm. It blasts the cultist, engulfing him in fire. His screams rip apart the night sky. When the flames end, all that can be seen is a pile of ash. I have had enough of this charade. Kobolds, disengage and step aside. They are mine. At once, the kobolds take the disengage action and retreat. Those on the rooftop jump over the edge without hesitation. They stand at attention, watching with eager eyes at Mondath, none making a sound. I will make you regret not dying sooner. Keeping her hand raised, you see a glowing white light begin pulsing from it. Donald and Joe, roll me a wisdom saving throw. Oh shit. That's not good. What? What's going on? I think we're about to get fucked in the ass. Oh no. Joe, use the bless roll. It wouldn't make any difference. Joe, your character suddenly finds your body rigged stiff. You can't speak or move. Every fiber in your body is solid still. You have been paralyzed. Donald, you managed to save against Mondath's attack, and so you are not. Even this bitch can't handle the stomp. I run forward and hurl a firebolt at Mondath. Your firebolt flies through the air, and just as it's about to hit her, she flicks it away with her other hand while keeping the first still raised. Fuck, we're so screwed. Calm down, Shapiro. I'll smash that in about two turns. Joe, Gormley is still paralyzed, and so you're unable to do anything this turn other than roll me another wisdom saving throw. You got it. Fuck. Use the bless! Oh yeah, okay. Does 14 what? You feel your body loosen and you stumble slightly. Guys, I think it's time for plan B. Let me have a swing at her first. If that fails, then you all run. Duck boy, you know what to do. Quack! Let's do this. I run at the pitch and swing with everything I got. Your axe makes contact and she staggers for a moment. Only human compared to me. We got this, guys. Seeing as Swole has indeed done some damage, I too will cast Firebolt at her. Oh, never mind. Your Firebolt flops in the air and lands on the ground. You have no idea who you're up against. We are the Cult of the Dragon. I am Frula Mondath, and tonight you will. She suddenly stops in mid-sentence and turns to look behind her. You can all hear a growing noise of roaring calls, many clanking footsteps, and a large horn blowing into the night. 
Along the river, you can now see a dozen armored guards charging towards you, led by Escobar the Red. Mondath screams angrily and begins running in the opposite direction as the kobolds advance forward. Can I get an attack of opportunity? She took the disengage action. Sorry, Donald. Oh well, I'll get another shot at her on my turn. Isn't the fight over? The cavalry has arrived? Not quite. The guards have now entered the area and begin clashing with the kobolds. The sounds of steel ring loudly as the guards attempt to take them out. Escobar runs up to Swole. Good to see you're still alive, lad. I thought we may have been too late. It'll take more than a few kobolds to finish off the mighty Swole Nald Stomp and his followers. We're his followers now? Glad to hear it. Now let's be having them. And he charges at the nearest kobold and swings his warhammer into its side. Looks like smooth sailing now, guys. We got this in the bag. All of you, roll me a perception check. What? Sharpen is the only one who spots it. High up in the air and coming straight down is the blue dragon from before. Its jaw opens wide and it roars. Oh shit, guys, dragon incoming. Get off the fucking roof. I run off the edge. Same, Same here. here. The dragon lands on top of the mill. It lowers its head and roars again. But not just at you and the guards, but at the kobolds as well. It pounds the roof of the mill and shouts into the night in common. Cease your fighting or I will burn you all. Everybody comes to a complete standstill. The kobolds look at each other confused. One of them attempts to speak with the dragon. Silence. I'm not here to converse, but to deliver. A dark figure emerges from behind the dragon. It leaps into the air and lands in the center of the battlefield. As it slowly stands up, it looks around. A tall blue half-dragon, muscular with piercing red eyes. He holds a long and impressive looking sword. And as he looks around the surroundings, his eyes fall onto each of you. He holds your gaze for a moment before finally resting upon Mondath. He grins, showing razor sharp teeth. And when he speaks, it is calm and dangerous. So, this is what you are using my guards for, Mondaf. Wasting resources and lives when I could have taken care of it. You dare to speak to me this way? I do. I told you, Mondaf, do not use my personal guard for your trivial matter. This is something I could have handled and you ignored me. And now look at the consequences. He begins to walk around the area, observing the fallen dead kobolds that litter the ground. One of the town's guards runs towards him. For greenest! In the blink of an eye, the sound of steel clashing, followed by a grunt, and the guard stood within arm's length of the half-dragon. Motionless, he seemed frozen, then slowly toppled over. The half-dragon was still walking as if nothing had happened. Abandon this foolish notion, Mondaf, and continue with the mission. The next stage has begun. Allow me to clean up your mess. Mondath makes a motion as if to argue, but the dragon above the mill growls low and she stops herself. Cursing under her breath, she turns on the spot and walks into the darkness. The half-dragon continues to walk around until his eyes find Escobert. He grins again and stops walking. Defenders of Greenest, tonight has been most successful for the cult of the dragon. You had things that we required. We now have those things. Our business here is concluding and we shall leave. Rejoice, as you will find peace again in your town. However, there is still one more matter that needs to be dealt with before we finish here tonight. He looks up at the dragon and nods. It reaches around its back and lifts something up and places it in front of its body. You can see that it is, in fact, three children. A teenage boy and two small girls. They are bound and gagged. We have in our possession 
free hostages. They were foolish enough to attack us upon discovering the death of their mother. I am not in the business of slaughtering the young. Therefore, we will give them back to you, on the condition that you agree to a contest of strength. Send forth your best and strongest warrior to face me in mortal combat. Nobody else can interfere or I shall update my business morals. Fight me, and I will allow them freedom. Who among you thinks they have what it takes? I step forward. Can I drink my potion of healing while I do this? Go ahead and roll for it. Nice, nearly max stats. Okay, I step in front of this guy. I am the strongest warrior you will find in this town. I will fight you. Don't do it, Swole. Hmm. Swole. Is that your name? Damn right it is. I am Swole Nold Stomp of the Clan of Stomp and the champion that will kick your ass. I know who you are. I've heard your name mentioned several times tonight, and it didn't take much to work this out. We knew there were two leaders causing this mess. One was that purple bitch, and the other was a blue half-dragon. So you're Kyanrath. Very good. Very perceptive of you. Yes, I am indeed Kyanrath. And you are the ones that have been getting in our way this night. Swone old stomp. I have not only heard of you, Swole, but I have witnessed some of your actions. I wonder, does that child remind you of anyone? He points at one of the two small girls. She has long blonde hair, and her face is oddly familiar. I look at the girl. Nope, can't say I do. Does she not have a striking resemblance to a particular woman that was within your company this evening? The one you let die. You couldn't protect a single person of this town, and yet you step forward to accept my challenge. I wonder... Is it bravery or stupidity? Motherfucker, he's really pushing my character's buttons, Dungeon Master. I'm going to rush him and ram my axe so far up his ass, I'll be able to use him as a cotton bud for the dragon's ears. You wish to attack him now? Are you sure you want to do this? I have a bad feeling about this, Trump. He's clearly trying to goad you. Maybe we should think about this and plan as a team. I attack! Or just ignore me completely. Good talk. Roll for the attack! You charge forward, your rage fueled by the reminder of the death of Lillian, the mocking from Kianrath, and your pride as a warrior. You raise your axe, and as you bring it down, Sianrath stops it in mid-air with a single hand. It rests in his palm. Was that the best that you can do? No wonder the woman died. I hear she was called Lillian. Tell me, does the shame hurt? Does it burn? Don't say her name. <laughs> Do something about it then. Silence me! While still holding onto your axe with one hand, he uses his other to slash at you with his sword. The blade cuts across your body. The first slash deals four damage, and the second deals a further three. You're making 
this far too easy for me, Stump. Have your axe back and try again. I'll swing at his legs and try to prone the fucker. He seems to have anticipated your moves, for as you swing low, he leaps into the air and lands behind you. Predictable. He counters with another multi-attack. The first slashing at your back, dealing three damage, but the second misses as you manage to dodge it. Quack. You got this lad, dodge and weave, then take the bastard down. Don't let him win swole. You can do it, stop! It seems you have quite the support group, Stump. Do you need to rely on others to make up for your weakness? Says the guy who needs an army of lizard groupies by his side. For the first time, you can see a glimpse of anger across his face. He throws his sword to the ground, raises his fists, and launches into a barrage of unarmed strikes. The first two miss as you appear to have a handle on it, but the next three all make contact. The first breaking your nose, the second your jaw, and finally the third to the skull. The impact was so severe you hear the skull crack. You stand there, slightly dazed, then sway on the spot and as if in slow motion, fall forward, legs buckling. Kianrath catches you by the throat and pulls you close to his face. It is over. He slams you into the ground, face first with such force the rest of you feel the ground rumble. He holds you there with contempt on his face. Stomp! If you are still capable of speech, Stomp, tell me, how does the dirt taste? Is it as delicious as failure or shame? I would not know. He stands up and rests a foot on Swole's back. This was not the challenge I had hoped for. Maybe we will meet again, and then you can try to last longer than a minute. But a deal is a deal. Release the children. Kobolds! We are finished here. The kobolds run in different directions. Kyanrath leaps into the air and lands on the dragon's back, which takes flight, leaving the children on the roof. It soars away as the light begins creeping over the town. The guards immediately climb the mill to get the children. Escobar and the rest of you head for Swole, who is lying unconscious, face down. I cast spare the undying. Swole turns himself over and opens his eyes. Swole, you okay, man? Are the kids okay? They don't look hurt, but I'm not sure if they'll ever be okay. We'll do whatever we can for them. If we ever see that fucker again, he's mine. Let us help you next time. I don't know if it's the concussion talking, but I'd appreciate your help, guys. I've been holding that guilt for uh, her. But maybe I should have some allies of my own going forward. What about some friends? Calm it down, elf chick. My head is already aching enough. Where did they go? We'll find out soon enough. We sent scouts. But for now, you all need to rest. Come back to the keep, lads. You start to make your way back to the keep when you hear a cat meow. Oh, I ring the bell. A pure white tabby comes running at you and leaps into your arms. Nice. Mission accomplished. I'm going to keep a firm grip on it in case it tries to go for Bama. Daylight fully breaks into the start of a new day. Although the night has seemed long and difficult, you get the sense that this is only the beginning of your story. And that gentleman will wrap up chapter one. Congratulations. Finally, fuck me. That felt like that took months. It was pretty long, but I get the feeling that if we condensed it all down, it would only be a few hours. Seems legit for D&D. &D. Yeah, that was great fun. I can't wait for what happens next. So what does happen next? I think this is the part we all get to level up. Right, Dungeon Master? You are indeed correct you all progress to level two. I understand you've had some discussions and have decided to stick to your current classes. Have you decided on whether you will take the average or will roll for your hit points? We'll need to have a think about that. Can we let you know by next session? Of course. We'll start next session by going over your character sheets. Thank you very much for taking time to play this campaign. I will see you all soon enough. Until next time, gentlemen, good evening. And thank you, viewers, for taking time out of your lives to watch this series of 
Tyranny of Dragons. I hope you have enjoyed watching it as much as I have been making it. Chapter 2 will begin in 2024. Keep the notification bell on for more updates. If you enjoyed this content, perhaps you could help the channel out by subscribing, liking the videos, and leaving comments. It all helps to please the dragon overlords of YouTube and shows that you want to see more of this content. If you want to go that extra mile of support, consider becoming a member of the channel. All proceeds go back into the channel to help keep it going. And if you didn't already know, we have a Discord group you can join and hang out with fellow fans of the channel, content creators, players, and dungeon masters. Come in and say hi. Thank you again. We'll see you soon.